All right, so we are live right now. Good afternoon and welcome to Edu Advisors webinar series, part of the Edu Advisor Virtual Education Fair, where academicians and industry professionals be weighing in on a number of topics, ranging from choosing an education pathway to jobs and careers. My name is Nina, I'm your host for today, and we have Dr. Tan Chi Fai, Associate Professor at the Faculty of Engineering in Utah, who will be sharing with us about the world in engineering and manufacturing. So just a quick background about a team speaker for today. Um, Dr. Tan Chi Fai uh, has been involved in strategic and technical consultation as well as research, design, and development of the intelligent manufacturing systems. Within, with 19 years of experience in the industry under his belt, he is actively consulting and assisting industry towards Industry 4.0, such as robotic systems, as well as big data analytics and artificial intelligence, to name a few. Awarded with the uh, Junior Chamber International Malaysia 10 Outstanding Young Malaysian Award Honorary in 2014, Dr. Tan is now the Associate Professor at the Faculty of Engineering in Utah. So thank you, Dr. Tan, for joining us today. It's uh, good to have you here. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the host, uh, MC for today, uh, my, my moderator, thanks a lot for the wonderful introduction on me. So a very good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, Dr. Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> so um, basically, before we begin, um, so our live audience watching, if you have any questions for Dr. Tan, do leave a comment and we'll get them answered at the end of the session. Also, don't forget to check out Twitter's virtual booth while you're at the fair. So, um, Doctor, are you are you ready to uh, begin your slide now, your presentation? Yes, yes. All right. So, without further ado, Doctor, you may go ahead. Okay. I think hopefully you can see my slide. Okay. Uh, a very good afternoon. Thank you for joining the uh, webinar that organized by the, the host. And uh, a very good afternoon. I'm G Five. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Mechatronics and Biomedical Engineering. Uh, Lee Kong Chen, Faculty of Engineering Science uh, of University of Tungo Abdulrahman. Okay, today my topic I will focus on the manufacturing transformation, the journey. Okay. Uh, before uh, we start the the, the, the webinar, I would, like, I would like to introduce about uh, Utah University of Tungo Abdulrahman. Okay, you can see the, the website www.utah.video.my. Okay, Utah is wholly owned by Utah Education Foundation. Okay, we are Utah. Utah, please, we look into the ARE. Utah is affordable, affordable for re with a reasonable fees without compromising on quality. We have various financial aid available for the student and lower living costs around the university. For the reputable, Utah is a reputable institution. Uh, Utah offers the quality and industry driven programs. Utah has a strong community support and orientation. Uh, Utah has a group of uh, passionate educators. And then uh, Utah uh, enables the employability okay, for the all rounded, we train uh, the all rounded graduates okay, and the students' soft skill and life skill de uh, development. And then uh, compulsory with the industrial training and uh, uh, industrial preferred as well. So this is Utah, A-R-E, we are Utah. Next one. Okay, Utah currently uh, in the rank of second in Malaysia uh, with the low university ranking. Uh, within Malaysia University, we are ranked number two after the University of Malaya, which is quite good. And this is from last year and this year as well. The recent uh, ranking of the low university ranking in 2020 in Malaysia, we are ranked number two in Malaysia. It's a very good news for Utah. And then uh, Utah is a, a premier digital tech university. This is a program under the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation. Okay, they awarded the Utah as a premier digital tech university status in Malaysia. And then it's recognized by MDAC, the premier digital tech university status uh, is awarded to Utah for its qualifications and commitment in offering top notch digital technology courses in Malaysia. Utah also won five awards, including the overall winner at the Premier Plug Challenge 2019 PBC by MDAC. 
And then we are the winner of Premier Park Chinese Tool of 2019, Microsoft Top Lecture for Artificial Intelligence uh, AI by Dr. Ng Ong Yi, and then uh, the same faculty with me, and Indal Best University in Curriculum Employment, uh, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, as an early doctor's uh, institute, and the top lecturers for data science uh, that awarded to Dr. Pratip Isawasan from Utah as well. Okay, this is the ranking. Uh, Utah is one of the eight institutions of higher learning, which received the self accreditation status by the Malaysian Qualification Agency of the Ministry of Higher Education okay, on 20th March 2017. Okay, when you look at the table, right, uh, Utah ranked number ranked second in Malaysia, and then Time Heiser Higher Education or Asia University ranking 2018, we are ranked uh, around 99, okay, among the Asian University, and Utah ranked second in Malaysia. For the Times Higher Education Young University ranking 2017, we are around uh, ranking around 101 to 150 around it. Okay. And for Time Higher Education Millennium University, we are number 14. For QS Asia University ranking, we are between 251 to 300. For QS WU ranking by subject, for the electrical and electronic engineering, we are in between 351 to 400. And QS WU ranking by subject, computer science and information system, we are ranked between 251 to 300. Okay, Utah campuses and location. Uh, Utah have two campuses, one at the Sungai Long campus, the other one at Kamba. Okay, the distance for these both campuses uh, uh, is, is around 180 kilometers. Okay. Kamba campus and Sungai Long campus. So for Kamba campus, uh, the faculty in the Kamba campus is Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Faculty of Business and Finance, Faculty of Engineering and Engineering Technology, Faculty of Science, Faculty of Information and Communication Technology, and Center for Foundation Studies. For Utah campus uh, in Sungai Long, we have a Lee Kong Chan Faculty of Engineering and Science, Faculty of Creative Industries, Center of Foundation Studies, Center of Extension Education, Institute of Chinese study. We also have a faculty of accountancy and management and faculty of medicine and health sciences in the Sunan Long campus. Okay, for Utah grad, uh, mainly we are Utah grad, we possible to uh, have a good position in the management and many are moving up to the rank. You can see based on this uh, chart, right? Majority uh, graduate can, can be a junior executive and then a uh, senior exec, and uh, most of them can go up in a very short time. Okay. Utah also have a web-based learning environment, WBLE, especially uh, during the MCO now. Okay. This uh, web-based learning environment is a very good, it's a good platform that provided the, the Utah student continuous learning uh, via the uh, online platform. Okay. Utah have a very good uh, conductive learning environment and uh, we have a very high employment rate. Most of Utah graduates uh, become a very uh, uh, hot cake that, uh, that captured by most of the industry or companies in Malaysia as well as international companies. Most of the companies prefer to look into the, the, the Utah student even though uh, before the graduate. We have, uh, this is a, a multiple various lab that are available in the Utah. And this is a uh, Utah also receive a strong support from industry uh, in terms of internship, job placement, as well as um, employability. You can look at the, the slide, right? You have uh, Intel, Microsoft, Argentin, uh, FreeSkill, Panasonic, Hi-O, Yansang, Kamuda, Jobstreet, and etc. Okay. Uh, for the engineering and uh, science program, okay, it's offered by the Lee Kong Chen Faculty of Engineering and Science Undergraduate Program. Uh, based on this uh, chart, you can see that 
for the metabolic, if you prefer the metabolic study, you can opt for the bachelor size uh, honors in actual size, bachelor of science honors in applied mathematics with computing, bachelor of science honors in financial mathematics. Yeah. For the programming related study, the, the student can opt for bachelor of science honors in software engineering. For pure science, you can opt for the bachelor of science honors in physics. Uh, for the built environment, the students can opt for the bachelor of science honors in the architectures. Uh, the next one is bachelor of science honors in quantity survey, surveying QS. Okay, for, for engineering program, right? Uh, they offer by the Chen Faculty of Engineering Science. There are more. They are playing a big important part. Uh, we have the Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Biomedical Engineering. Engineering. We have Bachelor of Engineering Honors in uh, Chemical Engineering. We have Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Civil Engineering. We have Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Electrical and Electronics Engineering. We have Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Electronics and Communications Engineering. And then we have a Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Electronics or Computer Networking. And a Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Materials and Manufacturing Engineering. We have the Bachelor of Engineering Honors in uh, Mechanical Engineering, as well as Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Mechatronics Engineering. It's all about the program that offered by the Gong Chen Faculty of Engineering and Science. Okay, for the FEGT engineering program in Gamma campus, uh, it's offered the Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Electronics Engineering, uh, Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Environmental Engineering, and Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Petrochemical Engineering, and lastly, the Bachelor of Engineering Honors in Industrial Engineering. For those parents or students who, who would like to know uh, more detail about the program, you can always refer to the uh, Utah website and look for the counselor. They can uh, provide the good services and the professional consultancy for you in, in terms of uh, which courses you prefer and uh, are suitable for, uh, for you. Okay. So this is uh, what uh, the activities are uh, in the in faculty of uh, Lee Guan Chen, Faculty of Science, uh, Engineering and Science. Uh, normally students will have a technical visit to the various industry. Uh, for, for this one, it's uh, showing the Taiking ratios in Denmark. And uh, from time to time, uh, faculty invite uh, uh, many of the industry players, main players, uh, engineers, consultants, and etc. to come over to Utah to give a guest lecture. Uh, this one is a guest lecture from the landscape architect. Right? And then uh, uh, we also uh, very actively to offer and uh, organize a lot of public lecture. This is uh, showing the 28th annual Professor Qing Fangqi Memorial Lecture. Uh, this location is uh, at the Institutional Engineer Mansion. You don't have a very close collaboration with an uh, NGO like, uh, like uh, Association of Consulting Engineer Malaysia, Institutional Engineer Malaysia, uh, IET Malaysia, and etc. And, and this one we also all uh, organize a lot of event, um, uh, non engineering event. Uh, this one is a cash flow game to to train the, the, the student about how to manage the cash flow, how to and, uh, get the higher value of the cash flow. Yeah. And then uh, we also organize from time to time with the seminar, and then some of the uh, staff of the of faculty is sharing how uh, the, the outcome of the RMD. And then we also have a lot of uh, collaboration with the international uh, university and institution. And we also have, uh, from, from time to time, we have an internet, international research project seminar as well in Utah campus. So the, uh, most of the students are very benefited uh, from this kind of activities. And, and we also have a symposium. Uh, this one is a National Chemical Engineering Symposium that, uh, in last year, 2019. And we also have a frequently organized workshop. Uh, this one is showing the seven platform of Asian architecture and urbanizing urbanism okay, in the Chinook workshop okay, where the Utah is a uh, core organizer and main organizer for this event and we also have a frequently for uh, uh, organizing a competition and uh, Utah students also very actively to join any local and international competition some of the uh, this is a show, 
showing that uh, our students are very active and uh, won some prizes and awards uh, for the local and international competition. Right. Okay, so next I, I come into the uh, myself. Uh, I will go into the uh, talking about the marketing transformation uh, to focus on the, the journey. So currently, uh, besides I'm an associate professor at the Lee Kong Chen Faculty of Engineering Science, uh, Utah, also a vice president of Institutional Engineering Malaysia. So as a lecturer in Utah, I need to be very relevant to industry. So that's why uh, Utah staff will encourage to actively to involve in the NGO so that uh, more so that the staff will very relevant to industry and uh, we, we can uh, share our knowledge and experience to our students yeah, to get to improve their knowledge and uh, uh, make our students more relevant to industry as well. Besides that, uh, I'm, a, I'm also a member of ISO, IEC, Smart Machine Standard Map Task Force. Okay? This one under the international IEC. Okay? And a member of advisor for the Malaysia Productivity Corporation, Machinery and Equipment Productivity Nexus Virtual Advisory Clinic, Mayweb. This uh, uh, appointment is uh, happened in the uh, last two months during the MCO. I'm uh, very fortunate and uh, honored to be appointed by the one of the Malaysia uh, Productivity Corporation, which is uh, one of the government agencies under the MITI to become an advisor for this program. So my task is to advise, give advice to, uh, to the uh, SME company uh, for them to uh, upgrade, improve themselves. Yeah, to face the, the impact of the COVID-19. Yeah. In, in, in addition, I also member of the Big Data and AI Working Group Committee on Engineering for Innovative Technologies, CIT, under the World Federation of Engineering Organi Organization, WFEO. So this is one of the, some of the events I, I involved. I'm a founder member for this uh, International Coalition of Intelligent Leveraging and uh, World Sensing Confederation and World Robot Corporation I show you this is because I want to show that uh, Utah stuff is very relevant to the industry. We have uh, a lot of events uh, that related to engineering, locally and international, so that we can uh, deliver the better services and better knowledge uh, and experiences to our students. Okay. For today, uh, right now, right, there's some key to take away. Even though it's not uh, not long enough, but at least uh, as a, uh, you as an audience, right, you can get something. Yeah, they understand what happened to industry now. Yeah. So for, for, for this webinar, I would, like you, I would like you to understand about the marketing transformation, what's the trend now, and to share the right mindset, how to choose the right skill set yeah, to prepare for the future and prepare for the uh, impact that happened now. So uh, World Economic Forum, actually we know consulting a uh, firm and an organization, yeah, or could have that. There is no returning to normal after the COVID-19. So we are in a new norm. Even though we are not yet finished the, the motion control order, right? Now under the now still in the, in the CMCO, okay? But we cannot go back to the normal life now. That's a new norm. That's why we need to move forward. We have to think what to do, okay? especially in the teaching and learning as well. Okay? Uh, Utah is well prepared for the, the teaching and learning. Uh, to especially to face the uh, impact of the COVID-19. Okay? Because as you can see, uh, under the uh, instruction of the uh, government, uh, students are not allowed to go back to the campus during the MCO time. So Utah is well prepared. We offer the virtual online uh, learning uh, platform to our students for them to continue study, uh, no matter, uh, even though they cannot uh, be in the campuses, so they can learn uh, the knowledge uh, from the home, from the from hostel as well. Okay. So this is something I just want to show you, the world stock and COVID-19 confirmed case. Of course, when the COVID-19 case uh, increased, right, the stock market, of course, is about the business right? market is dropping because uh, most of people cannot uh, go out to buy food, they have to buy the product, and then they cannot travel. A lot of business, businesses or industry have a very high impact on them. Yeah, it's very bad. So this is what happened now. So this one is to show you uh, as, a, uh, as a person, right? You need to prepare for, for it and try to innovate the process, how to uh, then uh, gain the necessary knowledge 
even uh, for the transformation as well. Yeah, for the company, especially the uh, revenue company, is desperate for transformation so that they can well prepare for it and facing another wave of the impact. So this is something uh, information that I gathered from the Department of Statistics Malaysia. This is what happened in the March twenty twenty. Look at this uh, table, right? Yeah, the Malaysia manufacturing sales are decreased three percent to uh in Malaysia one hundred ten point two billion in March twenty twenty, and then the sales value and sales value per employee also dropping minus. Of course, this one is a figure in the in the March twenty twenty. Okay, the number of employees and salary and wages are still in positive, but the for your information, uh, nowadays I think uh you can see the some some, some retrenchment start happening now. Right. And the sales value for the sales subsector, yeah, I say textile value, like apparel, vendor, food footwear minus 5.0%. And this sectors, wood, furniture, paper, products, and printing minus 5.8%. Okay. Most of the uh, subsector under the national government, right, um, uh, is, is a negative. Okay. Because it's an uh, impact. Here yeah, we are facing impact of the COVID 19. We, uh, we're facing the impact of the Mobile control lockdown. Uh, company uh, for non insurgent company they cannot operate hundred percent. For insurgent company they also cannot operate hundred percent, but they only can allow to uh, operate fifty percent. So the manufacturing company need to think about hey, what's the best way for them to operate. Uh, with fifty percent of the workforce to achieve the higher productivity, it's a challenge for most of the uh, SME company and as well as MLC the manufacturing. So some manufacturers are uh, able to innovate the process and increase the productivity up to 70 to 80%. It's, uh, it's very challenging, very right? time now. Okay, this one I'll show you. So what's the hot industry now? Of course, hand growth industry. Okay. Uh, Malaysia is a top in the world uh, for in terms of the uh, hand growth manufacturing uh, output okay. uh, compared to other countries. Okay, we have the top growth, we have the Hata Lega, we have Kawasan, we have Plybay, we have Contem uh, Creative Lab, and etc. There are many, there are some of the uh, top growth, com uh, growth companies already uh, available in Malaysia for many years. And during the pandemic time, COVID-19, growth industry, the sales increased a lot, really a lot. Okay, now the, the, the new order, okay, is available for the uh, new buyer only next year. Okay, June. You want you want to buy the new uh, the, the the hand group buy. You have to wait until next year, next June. Then you can get uh, the then you can place a new order and get your growth. You know. So this this kind of uh, hand group in the industry is a essential industry. Uh, they have a very uh, good support. Okay, for industry especially uh, facing the pandemic now. Another industry is a mask, face mask industry. Okay, Malaysia, we have a few face mask uh, manufacturers in Malaysia, like Medicost, Medidata, Creative Contract, and Cross Pollution, and etc. Okay, this industry also uh, play very important roles to support the local uh, medical uh, services industry, as well as uh, also contributed to the uh, Malaysian economy. This is a very uh, essential industry and play very important roles was during the pandemic COVID-19. Okay. This is a good news for Malaysia. Even though you are, I think you heard a lot of uh, news about uh, Malaysia, economy may be downturn, a lot of retrenchment, there's, but there's some good news as well. Uh, for, for this one, right? US pay NASA JPL. JP, JPL is a jet propulsion uh, laboratory. NASA jet propulsion laboratory okay, has guns K1. K1 is a local uh, tech company, technology company in, uh, located in uh, PJ. Okay. The license to manufacture and distribute the Vita ventilator worldwide. Okay. This is a very important uh, milestone for Malaysia company K1 to, to achieve this kind of uh, 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 license, to get this kind of license to manufacture the Vita ventilator for the worldwide. It's a great achievement for the Malaysia industry now. Okay, so this is the one, Vita Ventilators. 
this vendor meter is a is a very crucial, it's an essential product to help the, the COVID-19 uh, patient they have to overcome the, the, the breathing, to overcome the breathing uh, difficulties, right? And then the good news is that boss is to set up new plant in Penang. This is news uh in the third of June, just recently. Okay, boss is uh, set up set, set up a new plant. It means there are some companies that are really want to expand and move to Malaysia. Okay, another good news is, is uh in the May of uh, eight of May, right? Key site uh, start to open the uh, planning to open the new testing lab in Penang. Okay. This one reported by the star, and then the star also reported that we you know, has a global test center for medical devices in Penang. This was reported in, uh, on the second of June. You can tell the many of uh, I think the, there will be uh, many of the good news coming in uh, soon. Okay, there's some some industries badly impacted by the COVID nineteen, like the entertainment industry, uh, tourism industry, as well as a uh, sport industry. And others are hotel okay, and, and etc. The big impact. But from, from the other side, the manufacturing industry, uh, not not all. Some also doing very well to support the, the, the economy of the country. And uh, as well as you can see, this this kind of uh, multinational company, international company also uh, plan to expand their 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 plan and the services. Uh, new uh, starting up the new services in Malaysia. It's a good news, really a good news. Okay, for us. Okay, uh, when come to the industry 4.0, we have, uh, this one we are looking back uh, to the Malaysia. Okay, uh, industry 4.0, right, is talking about cyber physical system integration. Uh, that there's an integration between the uh, physical uh, product, physical element, okay, physical uh, instrument with the internet okay, uh, communication. Or communicate with the internet, uh, with the wireless, yeah, or the data or signal goes to cloud. This is talk about 4.0. How about before 4.0? We have the 1.0 that uh, normally the, uh, using the steam power or wind power or labor intensive to do a job. Then when there is a invention of the electric and the invention of the electric motor, we will using the uh, electricity to power the motor and then. To make the, the process line from there okay, over a year right uh, people invented the computer yeah and then uh, and then come to the era of uh, using a computer uh, embedded to the uh, refreshing line okay to improve the process so in the industry 3.0 we have the computer okay, pc and we also have a programmable logic controller or industrial pc or microcontroller that are uh, used in the process line to make the process to be uh, semi-auto or fully automated. And this is what happened to the 3.0. When come to 4.0, because of the uh, uh, advancement of the internet, uh, advancement of the uh, telecommunication technologies, yeah, and then uh, also the price of the telco uh, is getting lower and lower, and then the processing power also getting stronger. And the uh, price also getting lower. This is a this a kind of, kind of uh, uh, scenario, right? Is making the, the public, especially you and I, that the people, right, willing to accept the technology to be uh, uh, utilized in our daily life. Industry as well, they're able uh, able for uh, this uh, advancement and the uh, cost factor, right? Able to uh, utilize. Uh, enable the, the industry right to utilize the kind of technology to to their process line in order to optimize the process to improve the productivity to improve the outcome as well as to improve the quality and profit as well this is what they want but unfortunately Malaysia right they fall into these two two stages 2.0 and 3.0 some industry in Malaysia SME right is still in the 2.0 uh, era so they very dependency on the human labor labor intensive uh, process and some also they have a, a certain level of uh, automation, semi automation, but still really relies on the labor uh, workforce. Okay. Some, especially Yi and Yi, they are very advanced. They are, they are some process they can go for autonomous and fully automation. 
But for the industry 4.0, uh, in common, right, uh, not many uh, SME in Malaysia uh, really into this uh, industry 4.0. Okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a journey. Okay? So, so that's why the government pushing and uh, come up with a policy to encourage the SM, SME to go for the uh, industry 4.0. And then, uh, next one. Yeah, we are following this. It's a, it's a time. It's time for the uh, SME, especially during the uh, the COVID nineteen. Yeah, the when we are when we facing the COVID nineteen, right? With the impact of the uh, mobile control lockdown, is a uh, desperate for industry. It's go for the uh, industry four point zero to to do the digital transformation for their. Company. Okay. This one I'll show you that uh, it's a digital transformation. So now the most important thing for now is uh, what? Not the oil, it's the data. Data. Data is very important, especially during the internet uh, uh, era now, right? Most of us are using the smartphone. Okay? Some are use, using a laptop or computer. Okay? We, 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 we do a lot of uh, businesses. Uh, event uh, uh, whatever related to our life is all using the internet okay we just uh, buying the food online call the car online grab, grab food grab car uh, food panda we purchase a product online by uh, through the web lazada shopee uh, tmall and etc all the data have been captured by the platform for for the company to really understand the the behavior of you and i this is a trend now yeah. So that's why when we subscribe to any platform, yeah, all our data is captured and then they know our behavior. Yeah. This is what I will show you. Most of the company, they know about a lot of visible pain because visible pain is uh, visible to most of the top management, most of the industry. But how about the invincible or hidden pain? Hidden pain is something uh, that faces a lot of in, uh, problem, a uh, pain point by the manufacturers. Okay? This is the pain point. Most of the manufacturers, they, they need to deal with the scrap of waste and uh, deal with the replacement cost, deal with the downtime loss, cost of failure, the quality control, okay? the quality bad, and the reject, and the cons customer perception is changing, behavior changing, the safety, the reward of labor. This is all about the hidden pain. So to the, traditionally, yeah, manufacturers is depend on what on the human to type in, uh, look into the, the bottom of the left and right, yeah, climb up and down, yeah, and then you skydive here and there to really understand what's the cost and try to minimize and reduce the, the waste, the cost that happen because the cost is an impact, the impact on the competitiveness, competitiveness, yeah, so. As a manufacturers or the top management, you know, really look into it, see through what's the, the detail, the exactly the actual data that can be captured by the manufacturers in order to reduce the cost that occur and try to be competitive okay, to others, not only locally but also internationally. Yeah, this is an industry 4.0 solution. It's include the interoperability where the machine, device, sensor, people all communicate and uh, connect to, connected to with each other. It's very important. That's why now we, we talk about hey, can I use my smart, smartphone to, to know about what happened to my house? Yes, it's possible. You just install the, uh, the webcam, right? The network uh, capable, uh, network enable uh, webcam. In the house, and then you can uh, you can see look at your house from time to time, anytime, anywhere. Okay, uh, so so if you have any if, if you have a four G broadband, then it is able for you to to monitor your house. Yeah, not only monitor your house for, for security, but you also can monitor the the energy usage. You can switch on, switch off. Yeah, this one is the thing with the IoT now. Yeah, and then uh, information transparency. By using a technology, you just capture the data straightforward to your site without go to the person. We have person when you engage a person to to capture data, the data may be uh, some may, may, may the person may give you some uh, 
uh, some error data, okay? uh, not complete data, okay? the data may change. That's why by using technology, you can get more transparent data and uh, actual data. Okay? And then decentralized decision making is somewhere to, to cut off and reduce or rate that happened in the shop floor, in the process. Okay? This one, the, the, the system itself will, 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 will decide. And then technical assistant as well. So this is the industry forward, it's a national policy on industry 4.0. Uh, it's a policy by the Ministry of International Trade and Industry uh, launched on the 31st of October 2018. So this is an initiative by government uh, to encourage, uh, to attract stakeholder, like for especially the SME, to adopt the industry 4.0 technology and uh, improve the productivity. And uh, this strategy policy also create the right ecosystem Okay, for industry 4.0 and transform Malaysia industry capabilities okay, to a more holistic way. The ultimate goal for the industry forward is to improve the productivity of our Malaysia industry and ultimately is to increase the GDP growth of Malaysia. So the strategy enables for the industry forward policy is a funding, a government provides funding, provides support uh, the industry the infrastructure and then regulation uh, produce more skills and talent that uh, in line with the government policy for the industry 4.0 and uh, technology adoption is very important yeah and then uh, this one this industry forward focus on people process technology so for Utah we are catered for people we train the people the, the talent that cater for the industry for the future yeah and this is the enabling strategies that we did to our industry forward uh, national policy on industry 4.0 by Malaysia. So with Malaysia, we have uh, uh, around 11 uh, enabling technology. For the World Economic Forum, they have uh, 9. So we have SR2. This is a uh, uh, technology like big data analytics, artificial intelligence or AI, augmented reality, AR, cyber security, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, Internet of Things, or short form is like IoT, cloud computing, simulation, robot, advanced material, and system integration. So for the 10 skill, this is what the proposed by World Economic Forum for the 10 skill, top 10 skill that uh, the cater the, the change of the uh, industry, especially uh, industry 4.0 and digital uh, transformation. So in 2015, this is a 10 uh, skill that, uh, that needed by industry. But when you look at the 2020, the first skill is a complex problem solving. Because the system becomes complex, uh, students need to be trained to cater of this uh, complex problem solving. And then students need to have a critical thinking skill. And then uh, the student itself need to have a creative creativity mindset. And uh, then they know how to manage people. And uh, as well as they, they, they know how to coordinate with, coordinating with others, work with others. And have a, have a very good EQ, emotional intelligence, and have a good judgment and decision making, and a service orientation, and negotiation skill, and community flexibility. This is a 10 skill that, uh, that can uh, needed and cater for the industry 4.0. And I think this, uh, this kind of 10 skill, top 10 skill also very suitable for the uh, student and uh, to, uh, for, for future worker to face the impact of the COVID-19 as well. So for Utah, right, we have prepared uh, the, the comprehensive uh, syllabus and uh, good uh, content to train our st students to cater the industry yeah, with the skills that are uh, needed by the industry uh, and, and, uh, with, uh, the, that can cater the impact of any matter. Yeah? And then uh, last, the, the journey. The journey to start uh, for any digital transformation or maybe transformation is a is is a company. If you are if you have a company, uh, you need a like company with a common approach to a digital stage. Okay, such as a uh, company need to come up with a strategy plan. Okay, strategy planning mm, towards the short term, mid term, and long term plan. Okay, for the process uh, improvement, uh, adoption of technology to improve the process. Of course, you need to cater, retain, reskill, upskill the the talent uh, in order to. Uh, to maintain or to sustain the community growth 
yeah, for, for talent to operate <coughs> and uh, innovate the technology uh, into your process and improve the productivity and the growth and the profit for the company. And then uh, you need to have a good strategy, a task force, a team to discover the pain point and try to innovate. Uh, you say innovative uh, method to solve a problem and to use the state of art technology to cater uh, with the problem I think we use a pain point and try to improve the process and then next one this is called for uh, as a company wide uh, we do call, uh, de determine the, the call for a company yeah uh, let, let's say your company <coughs> deal with an e-commerce platform then you must know what the, what what the digital call for the company and then you need to build up the the, the, the culture the right culture the digital culture uh, with your your staff, with your employee, uh, not only uh, you, you can focus uh, to your employee and staff, you also need to focus on your supplier, yeah? supplier as well as your partner and the customer as well. It's very important, very crucial yeah? because you are in the same team, same group of people, even though they are not your employee, but because they are supplier, right? you need to make sure uh, the supplier also can grow with you, can have the same uh, similar uh, uh, channel review and similar uh, goal review, right? You know, engage your supplier, your partner, and your client as well to make sure it's, it, uh, the, the, the company able to transform. Yeah? And then the uh, 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 top management, a leader, uh, especially the boss, need to have a, this kind of digital leadership competency. As a boss, because you are the one who, who, who uh, invest, who confirm, who decide the budget, right? You need to have this kind of uh, uh, competency and the uh, technology savings, especially now, okay, to under, really, to really understand how technology can benefit can beneficial to your company. Okay? How technology, when they're implemented to, to, your, to your process, right, to your company business, right, how well if you, you, you improve it. So that's why you need to have this kind of competency to, in order you to decide which one to plug in. Okay? So that whatever you, whatever uh, method the technology that you make, right, it's worth. Okay, work for future. And then you need to have a comprehensive okay, digital transformation program. Okay? And then this uh, transformation program might also need to be uh, aware to all of your staff, okay, as well as your, your, your supplier, your partner, your client. Let them know. Okay? Let them know and let them accept it because it's not easy to change the mindset of the people. Okay? Many people that prefer status quo. Okay, in terms of uh, changing, because any change, any transform, or transformation program, right, when they look at it, when they heard of it, they feel pain, very painful. It's very stressful for them. So, uh, you need to have a, a, a good planning, good plan in terms of to educate, to to uh, embed this kind of culture among the staff, among the uh, supplier, among your client, and, and uh, among the partner as well. Okay. So lastly, I would like to share with you the slide uh, uh, quote from Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin said that it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Okay, it's really, uh, I really totally agree with uh, the quote from Charles Darwin. We need to respond to change, especially now. Uh, the world, the world, the world is facing the, the epidemic COVID nineteen. Okay, yeah, suddenly strike, suddenly most of us. You and I cannot go out, cannot work. Okay, the, the, the school also cannot open until now. Okay, and then uh, we ourselves, I think we change the norm, right? The whole way. Normally, when I give a talk, okay, share the, the share something, right? Like, it's through a face to face. Uh, I just attend uh, one seminar or talk face to face. Now nowadays, because of the uh, COVID nineteen, we cannot uh, face to face to, uh, especially to reduce the the, the risk. Yeah, of the infection, right? So that's why we go to the what the digital platform, okay, to, for sharing. Like like what happened to today, right? It's a it's a new norm. Okay, so I just look at the screen. You just look at me. Okay, there's no face to face, face to face uh, via the virtual platform. This is what happened now. It's a new norm. So, uh, university and student, uh, whoever parents, will need to change, respond to change. So we think about what's the best way, okay, to adopt it to to. To respond to change, uh, to accept a new norm, and then to uh, make our life better and better. So, Utah is a right platform, it's a good platform uh, to, to nurture the, 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 the future talent and then to support industry also uh, to build the, the good life and uh, love sound for Malaysia. I think uh, that's all for my presentation.
for now. And then, uh, thank you. Maybe now it's open for the question and answer. Hi, Doctor. Thank you so much for your okay. uh, very elaborative and very detailed explanation of manufacturing transformation and also coming into the new normal, yeah? Um, let's uh, do a quick one. Let's just answer some Q&A. Uh, doctor, can you see the uh, comments at the site, at the live comment section? Yeah, yeah comment. All right, so let's just answer. Yeah, if you have any comment or uh, question, just ask me. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's answer this one from Melina. I'm going to bring this up in the screen real quick. All right. Uh, for this one, you have to, uh, maybe I, you can engage with the uh, education consultant, uh, advisor from Utah to answer a question, right? This one, right. I think uh, no, no issue, and then you have to talk to the, to, to the advisor. Uh, which right. engineering field is the best to study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for this one, uh, it's, it's depend uh, to what you like. Okay. what the student like. Okay. Right. Now then we, we cannot force the student to, to to learn for something. The important is a mindset. You think that the, the right uh, the, the subject is right for you, you think it's a, you feel comfortable and then it's a good for future, please. Of course I would like to prefer to promote the industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is a is a future. Uh, most of countries like uh, US, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong Malaysia as well, Singapore as well, they all promoted the, the industry 4.0 uh, to be adopted, adopted by the industry. So maybe this is a field you can look into it. So for, for the Muta, right, uh, you, 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 you can refer to the uh, LKS, uh, Lee Kong Chen, Property of Engineering Science, to look for any uh, uh, suitable engine program that can, uh, uh, they, they, uh, you can take, uh, take out. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much. I hope Marina got that about studying uh, which engineering field is the best and also if for those of you who are wondering which um uh, what courses can you take please do ask the ask the counselors at UPAS virtual booth at the virtual education center. thank you so much dr tan for being here today we appreciate your insights and we do hope to see you again soon for our next webinar series okay is there any more question oh yeah there is one yeah there is one here yeah. no it's pretty long let's just see Oh, we, uh, what do you like about being an engineer? On a day-to-day -day basis, how have everything impact our life? Would be great to see what is a true, what is great. Okay, uh, for, for, for information, I'm uh, my background is uh, from the mechanical engineering and the manufacturing engineering. So I'm a practicing engineer. I'm a registered engineer with a board of engineer measure. So I'm a, a PE, professional engineer with practicing cert. So I can certify the, the technical drawing uh, especially in the mechanical drawing that we related to business services. Okay. Uh, my job is very, very, very important. And then uh, I also, uh, uh, of course, I'm also uh, an, an academic. Uh, uh, to make myself uh, more relevant to industry, I also have a uh, very much, very actively involved in industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as an engineer, we are, we are, we are, we are being trained to solve the problem. Okay. To, to solve the problem uh, of the industry in a professional way, in an ethical way. So we have a well well trained yeah, to to uh, to uphold the the to building to to what to build a good infrastructure to provide a good services to the uh, industry of, of course especially the people of Malaysia and then uh, manufacturing why manufacturing is very important because manufacturing uh, is one of the important uh, factors for the national GDP growth mm -hmm. okay that's why. The manufacturing in Malaysia is very important. So the, the, the even though the Malaysia are promoting the, the e-commerce right, but at the same time, Malaysia is promoting the manufacturing. For the industry uh, 4.0 policy by Malaysia government, right, they are focused on the manufacturing industry. They want to grow the local industry to be very international uh, competitive. It's very important. Okay? It's very important. E-commerce, of course, e-commerce and the marketing must work together. It's a one uh, entire supply chain, right? Entire right. supply chain. Okay? You need a very good e-commerce uh, to capture the business, not only local, but also international. Okay? When you capture the business, right? When you get a product, of course, you need a manufacturer to produce product, right? For this product. Okay? So for, for now, right? Uh, actually, the industry talking about, uh, if you know about B2B, business to business, 
uh, P2C business to customer. Now the, the most of the uh, online business, right, even industry, they talk about C to B, customer to business. What what is C to B? C to B means that with the data, because just now I mentioned about the data, right? Data is a good new goal, right? New oil, right? Uh, they capture a lot of information from the consumer. They capture they understand the behavior of the consumer. When the manufacturer understands the behavior of the consumer, it's easy for the manufacturer to create, produce something that cater your need exactly. Right. Uh, this is the industry now. So we have to know about it. But with the industry 4.0, yes, we're using a technology to capture. Before that, uh, in a conventional way, we don't know. Maybe we, we, we I talk to you face to face, then I try to understand hey, what you want. But only you. You alone. But for e-commerce, right, I can capture. If I if I'm product, product is good, right, I can capture. Let's say I got 100,000 subscribers under my platform. Oh, I got 100,000 information. So so I just focus on this 100,000. Okay, I know, I know, I try to understand the behavior of this 100,000 subscribers. It's good for me. Okay, right. not even 100,000, more than that. Right. Oh, okay. Cross border, because uh, uh, under the because of internet, right? It's a cross border, borderless. Yeah, borderless. We can capture a lot of information. We, we try to, uh, especially, we use a real time information for us to plan, for us to decide what to do next. Uh, so this is what we're going to the industry now. Yeah. Um, what about like a quick example and how manufacturing has impacted our life? Because I think for our students out there, like those who are probably still in high school or those entering, um, yeah. what, are, what is manufacturing? What is one simple thing that we, in our own surrounding, that manufacturing, uh, engineering, or uh, mechanical engineering has created for all of us to like... You talk about this one, right? Actually, uh, MCO, what is an essential product? What, what is an essential product for during MCO? COVID-19. Mm. That's what I mentioned. Top group, right? Corsa, yeah, yeah, yeah. medical devices, uh, sorry, medical product. Medical devices like the uh, respiratory. Mm -hmm. Ah, very important. Mask. True, that's true. EPE, and then the, the, the goggles, mm -hmm. the, the overall. Protective right, right, right. This, without the manufacturers, this this one is not happen. Right. Yeah, we talk about the face mask. Face mask is just not a simple uh uh kain or cloth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you a, yeah. Yeah, you need a chemical, petrochemical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need a machine itself to make the what the, the material that the cross is a I don't know pro moon pro melt pro melt. Uh, no? Forget the, the, the technology. You need that. You need a, a, a yeah the machine. But with the machine, you need human, the technical people, like uh, engineers, technicians to support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you want to build the machine in Malaysia, you need a technical people with know how. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, engineer, technician, technologists. Okay, to build an entire machine. Okay? Yeah. Of course, you need government support. Government support uh, the entire ecosystem. So in the university is one, one of the ecosystem to provide uh, the platform uh, to train the talent and uh, the, the platform to upskill, reskill, yeah, to support the industry. It's very important. So Utah is a, one, one of the institutions that provide this kind of platform uh, to uh, to train the, 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 the skilled people, the skilled engineers uh, to support the industry. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. That was very, very insightful. Um, also, I think it gives a very clear idea of how important manufacturing is in our daily lives in general, basically. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tan. We hope that we can... Uh, thanks, Nina. Thank, thank you, Nina. Thank you. For the, uh, me. Okay, thank you. Good luck. And stay Bye. safe and stay healthy. Yes. All, right. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. So, oh. So there you have it. That is um, Dr. Tan from Utah explaining to us about manufacturing. Our next speaker, our next speaker, yeah, um, we have the Associate Dean for Research and External Affairs in the School of Health and Sciences, Professor Chin Big Yeo, alongside Professor of Applied Biomedical Sciences and Biotechnology, Professor Anthony Rhodes from IMU, who will tell you all the crucial roles of medical uh, biotechnology and biomedical sciences during a pandemic. So I can say, see here, 
Professor Chin and Professor Anthony is already in the stream. Let me just pull them up real quick. Hi, Professor. Just pull up Professor. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. All right. We have Professor Hi. Chin. Hi, Professor Chin. Yeah, I'm in the office, you know. <laughs> All, right. All right. So for those of you who just tuned in to our webinar series, Good afternoon and welcome to Edu Advisor Webinar Series, part of the Edu Advisor Virtual Education Fair, where academicians and industry professionals will weigh in on a number of topics, ranging from choosing an education pathway to jobs and careers. My name is Nina, I'll be your host for today, and we have Professor Chin, the Associate Dean for Research and External Affairs, um, as well as Professor Anthony Roth, an expert in applied biomedical sciences and Biotechnology from IMU. So both of them will be sharing with us about the crucial roles of bio of medical biotechnology and biomedical sciences during a pandemic. So just a quick background about our esteemed speakers today. Um, I think there's like some sort of uh, interruption in the background. I think, but both of you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. So a little a little a quick introduction. Um. She is an established academic researcher in the field of toxicological sciences. Professor Chin has a string of renowned institutions under her belt, graduating from John Hopkins University, carrying out her dissertation research at both John Hopkins and Yale University, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the U.S. Department of Energy. She is also a passionate educator uh, and was part of the preclinical teaching faculty at Harvard Medical School. Now, she's the Associate Dean for Research and External Affairs in the School of Health and Sciences at International Medical University. Moving forward with uh, Professor Rhodes, with an extensive area of expertise, Professor Rhodes, a biomedical scientist working at various hospitals and institutions for 19 years before he began his academic career in 2003 as a senior lecturer in cellular pathology at the University of the West of England in Bristol, UK. Cited over 1,400 times in the International Scientific Indexing or ISI publication. His journals on prognostic biomarkers in breast cancer contributed to the evidence base for a range of national and international breast cancer guidelines, namely the UPNHS and the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. So, Professor Rose is currently lecturing and conducting research in the field of applied biomedical sciences and biotechnology at IMU. So there you have it. Thank you, professors, for joining in today for our webinar session. All right, so a quick one for our audience. Uh, for those who are joining in, do leave a question in the comment below or anything in the comment below in either Facebook, YouTube, or our affair, and we'll get back to it at the end of the session. And do check out IMU at our virtual fair um, today. So, professors, are you ready to present your slides? Sure. Yep. All right. Okay. So let's bring. Okay. Um, before we we proceed, I would just like to tell uh, the audience um, basically a format. <clears throat> so, um, Prof. Tony Rhodes. I'll just call him Tony. Tony and I will sort of have <laughs> a presentation, kind of dialogue, where we will talk a little bit about our. Um, why we chose our careers a little bit about ourselves. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the importance of biomedical science and medical biotechnology to us. And at the end of the talks, we're gonna uh, briefly discuss the importance of both biomedical sciences and medical biotechnology in a crisis situation such as uh, uh, this current pandemic. Okay, so I'm gonna give the floor to Tony and he can start us off. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, so, in the next in the next slide, I would sorry. Is the sound okay? I'm getting a bit of an echo. It's okay. Sound. Um, in the next slide, I'd just quickly like to go through uh, my career and then quickly move on to why I chose uh, biomedical sciences. Um, I graduated in 1984, uh, University of Luton. Uh, I sent off many job applications, only received two letters back. Uh, one was an invite from uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, 
I went along for an interview. They liked me. I liked them. And for the next three years, I, I worked there. I achieved my certificate in competence in uh, histological techniques and became uh, state registered with the Health and Profession Council and, and was then in a position to work anywhere as a practicing biomedical scientist in the UK. However, I carried on to take my professional uh, fellowship of the Institute of Biomedical Scientists, uh, which allowed me to go for senior jobs. Um, I then went to get a greater experience at St. Thomas's Hospital, and then went for a senior job at Hammersmith Hospital in the west of London, um, and then uh, a senior chief job in charge of uh, the pathology laboratory at uh, University College London. Um, whilst there, I did my PhD part-time and indeed um, done all my uh, qualifications uh, part-time whilst I was working apart from my first undergraduate degree. I then decided to uh, teach the subject that I love doing, which is cellular pathology, and moved to Bristol as a senior lecturer, and then worked my way up the academic uh, tree to professor of biomedical research in 2010. I was then collaborating in breast cancer research with Professor Cheng Hai Yip at University of Malaya and went out there, uh, first on a sabbatical for one year. I liked Malaysia so much that I decided to stay for another three years and I was appointed as professor in the Department of Pathology. So I did not only research and teaching, but I was also considered to be useful in troubleshooting all the technical problems and issues uh, which occurred um, um, now and again in the routine clinical uh, pathology laboratory. Um, in 2018, I was recruited by Taylor as a part of their strategic research in initiative. Um, I spent two years there, and then recently, in March of this year, just before all the uh, borders closed up, uh, I started work at IMU. So now I'm going to turn to the next slide and tell you why I chose a uh, career in biomedical sciences. Okay, so um, firstly, I'd, li I'd like to uh, use a quote from a very famous author, but she's so famous I've forgotten her name, um, that said, if you're giving careers advice to young people, you should ask them what they enjoy doing and then tell them to find somebody to pay them to do it. And basically, that's what I did. I had an interest in biology, and I, I knew I had no... I had little uh, ability in physical sciences or engineering or mechanics or whatever. Um, but I enjoyed uh, biology. I found it interesting. Um, but I had no idea how I was going to use that interest uh, after I graduated. So I went along to University of Luton for three years. And during that time, I was exposed to various laboratory sciences, um, some of which I didn't particularly like, and others I practical experience of um, being exposed to histology and cytology um, that uh, really fascinated me. I was really um, amazed to, to see this new world that I could visualize down the microscope after processing uh, tissues and uh, staining them with all these wonderful uh, colored histological dyes. And I knew then that I wanted to pursue, pursue a career in histology, and that's why I applied for biomedical sciences when uh, I graduated. So just I'd like to emphasize at this point, um, all you new uh, students who are thinking of uh, your first uh, degree, don't necessarily think about how it is going to uh, provide you with a career. Think about it all as exposing you to new areas of science, areas which you haven't explored before. Uh, and I'm sure that one of them will uh, fascinate you in the same way that histology fascinated me. And that will help direct you in your career uh, and indeed uh, pursuing a career that you're likely to continue for the rest of your life. So in, with biomedical sciences, it allowed me to increase my technical skills in histology, and become state registered. Um, and it also allowed me to gain additional professional qualifications um, and indeed um, academic qualifications, such as my master's and PhD, all of which were done part-time whilst I was working. And that was important 
uh, the job provided uh, security. I had a young family and I needed to provide for them. Um, but it never seemed like work. It almost seemed like a part of my life. Um, it was very much a team effort. It was far less intense than studying. You went in at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, you worked as part of a team. You went to coffee together. You went for lunch together. You celebrated together when someone had a baby or got married, or probably in the reverse order, or maybe not always. But um, And so basically it was a, an enjoyable experience. Um, and um, it suited my personality. You'll find in, in sciences that it, um, it often requires different source, skill sets. Histology is very quite subjective. It's quite hands-on, whereas something like biochemistry is far more analytical, quantitative, um, and objective. So you will find you are attracted to different areas of science de depending on your personality. And it's only during your first undergraduate degree are you likely to appreciate these difference, uh, differences and indeed find something which you love doing? Um, so, yeah, so I, I was basically qualified to go and work anywhere in the UK which had a hospital as a biomedical scientist. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to emphasize the quality of the uh, IMU degree and that it is one of only five Malaysian universities and only one of two private Malaysian universities, which is uh, credited with the UK Institute of Biomedical Sciences. And this is really uh, a badge of quality. Um, and theoretically, it would allow you to go and work um, in the UK following a short period um, of practical experience in the laboratory, and um, during which you obtain your certificate of competence. And along with your IMU degree, you would then be qualified to work at any of the laboratories, any of the hospital laboratories uh, in the United Kingdom. So that's given you a quick flavor of my career to date, um, why I chose biomedical sciences. And now I'd like to hand um, the floor over to BY, who's going to similarly um, tell you about her career and her interest in medical um, uh, biotechnology. Thank, thank you, BY. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, uh, actually, you, you, you made a few key points from your end um you know like like you uh, i really had no clue what i wanted to do and i dabbled a lot as you can see in my career in a nutshell you, you know i i was um i grew up in the united states and uh, so that's basically uh, the, the system of education that that i remember um, so you know went to high school and then when I went to college there in the U.S., it's a four-year degree. Uh, you have one year where you can do your final year project, but you can also take a lot of courses that are outside your major because then it allows it allowed us to become uh, more appreciative of what's going around us. So I actually took art history and I took philosophy uh, during the, uh, that particular final year. That's why we have a Bachelor of Arts instead of Bachelor of Science. And, and so at that time, I really knew I wanted to do some sort of biology. And so then I w went to work at the Children's Hospital in Boston. It was the first job. Um, and it's okay to work after, just like Tony, it's okay to work after your first degree because then it gives you an opportunity to practical, uh, to test your practical application skills, whether you you can remember what you learned in college and then apply it in the workplace. So basically, after a few years, I decided, ah, I don't want to work anymore. I want to get another degree. So I applied to Boston University. Um, why? Because I love Boston and because they gave me a scholarship. Um, so, you know, at that time, I was pretty naive. But then I figured that, you know, I didn't like working with the topic that uh, at the time was microvascular research. I, I didn't really appreciate that much. So, and the reason why was because I was more interested in the environment, environment, environmental pollutants, how the pollutants affect uh, our body. So then I transferred to Johns Hopkins, I had a full scholarship and, and um, I did a master's in physiology. And um, I thought physiology was a good stepping stone for me because it allowed me to learn about the human body, but I really wanted to learn about the environment. So then I decided to get a job around the Johns Hopkins area. 
And after that, figured that um, I should apply back to school because I know exactly what I wanted to do for my PhD. So the the foundation set up by my bachelor's and my master's actually opened the door for me to do a PhD also at Hopkins in toxicological sciences. So um, I my two advisors were from Hopkins and Yale, so I spent all my time at Hopkins doing the the classwork, and then I did all my research at Yale University. So after graduating, I then did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Department of Energy at PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington. Incidentally, that was uh, that site was very close to where the first atomic bomb was created, so I didn't know that. But, uh, you know, it, it was kind of fun. Um, and when 9-11 happened, I was there, so it was kind of scary. Um, so I was in the molecular toxicology department, and, and after my contract was up in three years, I went back to the East Coast to uh, to, to Boston, and that's where um, I re became a co-faculty at Harvard Medical School, teaching Harvard Medical students, as well as doing research at the Harvard Teaching Hospital at Beth Israel. And in between, I, I did a little bit of um, uh, part-time work at a startup biotech company called Alfama. And that's where I, I really learned, appreciated how the industry plays a huge role in academics, where you know what you do in academics, if you want to push it forward, you basically have to work with biotech companies. So then about in 2012, you know, I decided to come back home to Malaysia, and I was at Sunway for a year and a bit. And then I and left Sunway and came to IMU. And the reason why is because I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to be in a medical environment, medical school environment, and also I wanted to do medical biotechnology. So then uh, my degree is in toxicology, and then why am I a faculty in the division of medical biotechnology? It doesn't make any sense, right? So I'm going to explain a little bit about why I chose toxicology as my, my choice. Um, like Tony was saying before, you know, it really, we, we really have to try different things, different flavors in our careers before we finally decide what we wanted to do. You know, when, when I was growing up and when I was doing my bachelor and my master's degree, I was really interested in the human and, and, and the animal science, right? And, and as I said before, then I decided, yeah, that's so, animals and humans, you, you can only do so much with it. Because what's most important is the pathology, just like what Tony was saying, the pathology part where you actually find out what goes wrong. And, and, and that was my, my interest towards the, the, uh, the end of my time in the U.S. was the effect of pollutants in our lungs. So I was driven by that, in particular, mostly how carbon monoxide, which in our bodies is a product of heme degradation, but in, in the real world outside, is a product of car exhaust, factory pollutants, how that becomes beneficial to us, but it's toxic to other, or in other situations. So then as a toxicologist, how can a beneficial molecule such as carbon monoxide be produced in the body, but it's toxic when generated outside the human body? So that was one of the things that really drove my, my, um, my sense. So, what is medical biotechnology then, and why does it fascinate me? Yeah. So before I explain what medical biotechnology is, it's a little bit harder to understand than biomedical sciences. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, medical biotechnology is a medical science discipline that uses the core principles of genomics, pharmacology, toxicology, which is that's why I'm part of it, human biology, and all these lists of disciplines. So. The, um, under the umbrella of, med of medical biotechnology, lab toxicology. So I'm going to break down me med medical and biotechnology into two simple words and terminology so we can fully uh, appreciate what it is. So the first part is med medical or medicine. What is medicine? It's the science that figures out how the cells and organs in our body works and how we manage and treat these kind of diseases. So then what is biotechnology? Biotechnology is the use of bio, it's the use of biological processes of any living organisms. As you can see on, uh, on the slide panel, you see bacteria and then you see uh, viruses there. So the use of any living organisms to help us live long and productive lives. 
So when you put it together, medical biotechnology is a discipline of biotechnology that primarily studies DNA in living organisms, such as viruses and bacteria, and uses them to come up with ways to help us treat and manage diseases. So that is, that is my, my take on why I was interested in medical biotechnology. And you heard Tony's take on why he's interested, and why he, he de devoted his, his life to biomedical science. So now we, we're going to switch over and talk a little bit about the relevance of of um, the relevance of biomedical science and medical biotechnology in crucial crucial situations like the pandemic. My apologies, there's a grammatical error on the slide. So I will then hand off the floor to Tony, so he can then talk a little bit about the important role of biomedical science in a pandemic situation. Okay, thank you very much, P.Y. So firstly, uh, in considering biomedical scientists and COVID-19, you need to consider the hospital and who does the diagnostic testing in the laboratory in the hospital. Uh, where's the pathology services? So it's not all about autopsies and post-mortems. It's all about uh, doing things such as uh, typing blood. So if a, an emergency doctor um, is treating a patient with a, a road traffic accident and they've lost a lot of blood, then they need to um, infuse the correct uh, blood type into the patient. So it's the biomedical scientist who will do this as part of an emergency, part of a 24-7 uh, service, uh, and provide the doctor with the correct blood type. Similarly, if a patient has a bacterial infection, and uh, the doctor doesn't know what type of uh, bacteria it is or, or what type of uh, antibiotic would be most appropriate, then, um, then the biomedical scientists will work in the laboratory, identify the specific type of bacteria, and, and tell the doctor which antibiotic the uh, bacteria is sensitive to and therefore uh, cure the infection. In tumors, if people are suspected of having a, a cancer, then they will have tissue biopsy, this is then processed by uh, biomedical scientists um, and tested so that it can be examined under the microscope to identify whether there are, in fact, any tumor cells there. And if there are tumor cells, is it a benign cancer or is it a very malignant cancer? And what type of cancer is it? Um, and then that, that, again, will go back to the uh, doctor on the ward treating the patient uh, who will be more able to effectively treat that patient. So all this goes on in the pathology services of a hospital laboratory. It's a bit like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, biomedical scientists uh, working like uh, Sherlock Holmes, trying to identify the uh, suspect disease. Um, Sherlock Holmes gives the information to an inspector, um, I've forgotten his name, from Scotland Yard, uh, but um, the biomedical scientists give their results to the hospital doctor and therefore able to then effectively uh, treat treat the disease. And it's the same with COVID-19. Um, the pathology services laboratories are fully accredited, which means they're staffed by qualified biomedical scientists and biotechnologists who fully appreciate the quality control required to ensure that the COVID-19 testing is accurate. Um, they understand what happens if the testing goes wrong and it looks like it's a false negative or false positive. They understand which are the most appropriate tests to use um, and ensure that the reliability of COVID testing um, is as good as it can be. And lastly, in some instances, we even uh, comment on government policy. A few months ago in the UK, um, the health minister came out and said he wanted to increase the COVID-19 testing to 100,000 uh, tests per day. And the president of the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, our professional body, had to come on the TV, national TV, local newspapers, and actually inform the government that, yeah, we, we have the manpower to do that testing, but we don't have the consumables. Uh, there's a problem in a consumable uh, supply chain, and there just aren't the amount of kits, the appropriate uh, testing kits, to do that quantity of testing per day. But, well, that was a few uh, months ago. Uh, things have changed uh, since then. But it's just one example of the role that biomedical sciences play in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right up to the point of um, advising government. So 
thank you very much. That's my little piece on COVID-19. I'll pass it over to uh, BY. We'll talk about uh, uh, biotechnology in, in this area. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, so um, be, be, before I talk a little bit about the role of medical biotechnology in uh, a pandemic situation, I, I want to share with all of you, um, those of you who are not familiar with medical biotechnology, how medical biotechnology impacts our daily lives. So for example, I'll give you a historical sample, you know, way back in the 1950s, you know, for those of you who have relatives with uh, diabetes, in the, in the way back then, the only, only way to obtain insulin is by taking it and isolating it and purifying it and sterilizing it from the pancreas of animals. You know, may it be uh, pigs, cows, I, we, we don't know at the time. And so what happens is um, the researchers would go and collect the pancreas from the local, local slaughterhouses and they would grind it up and then purify it and sterilize it and then bottle it up. And so that's how it was in the 1950s. So diabetic patients who were suffering from diabetes, this is how they injected themselves with insulin and get treatment. So then, you know, when the human DNA, uh, when not only human DNA, when, when uh, DNA of the sequence of insulin was deciphered, both in animals and humans, uh, done by medical biotechnology, of course, um, the, the biotechnologists then engineered bacteria as protein factories to generate human insulin. So how, does, how, does, how did it happen? Well, that's for another time, but basically it's trying to tell you is if you go to your refrigerator, those of you who have um, parents, aunties, uncles, or friends who have um, diabetes, if you look in at the, uh, the insulin bottle, it will say, their recombinant human insulin or RH insulin. That is the bacterial derived insulin. So currently right now, most of the insulin available on the market is derived from bacteria. So I, I wanted to add this to the um, Malaysian audience as well. Uh, uh, within the next year or so, we ha actually have uh, in Malaysia, a uh, biotech company in Malaysia that is actually producing yeast-derived insulin will be on the market uh, within the next year or so. And so this is biotechnology in the forefront in Malaysia where you have yeast, you know, the stuff that you find in bread, right? Yeast being used as a possible protein factory to make uh, insulin. And, and this yeast-derived in insulin is going to be four times cheaper than bacterial-derived insulin. Okay, so that is one of the fact of medical biotechnology that not many people realize is biotechnology, but it is biotechnology. And why is that important? Because the only reason why we can use yeast and bacteria as protein factories is because we have the DNA sequence and we have the technology to incorporate that particular gene into, the, the, into our human cells. So... Then we go to the next slide where you see here, um, the right panel, by understanding the genetic code of how DNA is put together, then medical biotechnologists is able to take advantage of this and manipulate DNA in pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. So once the DNA in pathogens have been sequenced, then, can you, then only can you develop tests to detect the bacteria and viruses in our bodies, which brings us to this particular important slide. So, Medical biotechnology and COVID-19. Why is medical biotechnology important in this particular pandemic? Uh, we, it's going to be divided into two sections. The first is screening and testing. The second is management and prevention. So the first, let's go to the screening and testing because this is key. Late last year in December and early January, when COVID-19 really came, came, uh, came on globally, the Chinese scientists, Chinese medical biotechnologists actually sequenced the virus. The virus itself that we know of in the public is called COVID-19, but the actual virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS-CoV-2. It's very similar to the SARS, original SARS virus. And so these Chinese biotechnologists then share this particular sequence with everybody. So once this sequence has been uh, detected, uh, ha has been uh, deciphered, what medical biotechnologists did was then they came up with a testing kit just like what Tony was mentioning before, using a testing kit to then detect 
the presence of this SARS-CoV-2 in our bodies. If you can look at the bottom left screen, so the cartoon, the the cartoon on the, uh, the box here is an actual picture or an artist's rendition picture of the COVID virus itself. And then the picture at the bottom is my own poor description, cartoon cartoon like description of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now the, the unique thing here is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you see the little T's, all the T's around. They use those T's to attach to the human cell and inject themselves inside. So this is how SARS actually, uh, I mean SARS-CoV-2 actually invades human cells, right? So, so you see the important role of medical biotechnologists, how the biotechnologists are able to sequence the DNA, and then they find out that this is this, this is basically the genetic structure, and then how we can then use this structure for good, meaning how to detect the viral DNA in our bodies in infected uh, in infected body fluids. Okay, so that's the screening and testing. So now we go to man management and prevention. So before I go into the genetic code vaccine development, let's, I'll just give you a brief, uh, very brief description of how vaccines are developed. So normally vaccines are developed from viruses that are killed. So what happens to the, the biotechnologists is they isolate the particular virus, like in this case, SARS-CoV-2, they grow huge quantities of it, and then they inactivate or they kill it, right? So, and why do they inactivate and kill it? Because they don't want the virus to be active. So it's still a virus, but it's not effective. So what, in the next process, what they did was then they then inject the kill virus in animals to test it first, obviously. But I'll skip the animal part, I'll go directly to the human. So then they inject the kill virus into our body and our body then responds to it it, remember, the virus is not, not infective. It's just, it's dead, but the entire pro, uh, body is there. So our body then makes antibody against that particular kill virus to create memory cells. So the next time we get an infection, those memory cells can be called up very quickly, and then they will they'll mount an immune response and kill it, All right? So update COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So medical biotechnologists, what, what we just talked about, has figured out this genetic code of the entire virus, including what we call those Ts. Those Ts are what, what they term it as spike proteins, right? So what the medical biotechnologists did was instead of coming up with a vaccine on, uh, that's targeted towards the entire virus compound, they then chose a particular protein, which is a spike protein, to create uh, a more rapid vaccine. Why? Because it's easier to use a particular sequence of uh, the virus than the entire virus. And why is this spike protein important? Because without the spike protein, this particular virus cannot enter our bodies. So the spike protein is needed to dock and then and, and inject itself into our bodies. So what medical biotechnologies have done now is they've They've sequenced the spike protein, and they are doing exactly the same thing as I just described for vaccine development, but to use spike protein as the vaccine. So this is basically what's going on right now is SARS-CoV-2, and Tony has mentioned the oh. antibody testing diagnostic kits. So that's to recognize uh, particular antibodies that's been generated towards the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 itself. And that antibody testing doesn't tell you whether you have the disease. It tells you, uh, or infection, it, it tells us whether that person has been previously infected or was previously infected and didn't know they were infected. So that's, that's the protein portion. Now we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about the DNA recognition test, which is the test, actual testing itself. So by creating a vaccine against a spike protein, it, it, it will make it a lot easier and faster and cheaper to then make a vaccine with the entire virus body because it's going to take a long time. You're going to do a lot more testing towards that. So, so the, the most recent update, it was a few days ago, uh, 
biotech company called Moderna and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease have partnered together to come up with that spike protein vaccine, which is called mRNA-1273. So as of July 1st, there will be a clinical trial happening, phase three, which is almost close to uh, manufacture and, and production. That will happen next month. So it's, it's actually very rapid. And this is because biotechnology has progressed to the point that they can actually minimize, the, the uh, actually shorten the time of vaccine development by targeting a specific, specific molecule on the protein, I mean, on the virus itself. Okay, so this is where medical biotechnology, current and future in the COVID-19, how, what role it plays. Okay, so um, before we, we do a Q&A, uh, like Tony was saying, you know, um, med uh, biomedical science is one of the unique programs um, in Malaysia, when, which I will let him talk a little bit more. Okay, Tony? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I said the, the, the main um, point about the IBMS. Uh, we're accredited with the uh, UK Institute of Biomedical Sciences. Uh, this is a badge of quality. Um, it also puts it on par with the same um, biomedical science courses run in the United Kingdom. So a graduate from Malaysia who obtained a post uh, in the uh, United Kingdom after a short period of um, practical uh, induction in the laboratory and, gain, and doing a portfolio and obtaining a certificate, certificate of competence would be fully qualified to work at any of the hospital laboratories in, in the UK. Um, we also partnered with um, a range of international um, universities, including uh, University of Newcastle in Australia, um, University of on on Otago in New Zealand, and Strathclyde uh, University in the United Kingdom, who similarly have uh, IBMS accreditation. Um, uh, BY, do you, do you want to expand on the uh, medical biotech? Uh, sure, definitely. Um, so uh, the, the medical biotechnology also has uh, partner schools. One is Newcastle in Australia, uh, where you, you can credit transfer or articulate there after two years in Malaysia. And our other partner school is Strathclyde in the United Kingdom. Um, in But this is for... for uh, master's program, which means that you complete three years in um, IMU, and then you automatically enter Strike Life either in, for industrial biotechnology or for forensic science. Now, the, um, the really good point of Strike Flight is we, the, our students, for both biomedical science or medical biotechnology, if they choose this, this particular pathway to do their masters in Strathclyde, they actually get a bursary of sorts. So please contact us if you want to know how much this bursary is. It's it's a really good um, good incentive uh, to to continue your masters with our partners with Strathclyde, and the possibility of securing industrial partnerships. I mean, not to say industrial partnership, sorry, industrial jobs is, is really, really good there for both biomedical science and medical biotechnology. And I want to talk a little bit about Newcastle as well. Um, our partner in Newcastle, um, we actually are able to send you there to do your internship training as well. And, and so uh, we, we have collaborative projects. And then so, so this is one of the enticing factors uh, for both biomedical science and medical biotechnology is to have this ability where you can do your your two to, two, two to three years here in, in I'm in Malaysia, and you don't have to worry about applications and anything like that. You can just directly go transfer to these uh, three universities in, in United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. Okay? All right. So I think we're done with our discussion, uh, our little presentation. So we're open to have questions. Yes, hi. Thank you, professors, for a very insightful and honestly, it's very detailed. And I think we learned a lot about the progress of COVID-19, even in the country, even in Malaysia itself, yeah? Um, let's go and see the questions that we have here. Uh, professors, if you look to your right, you can see the live comments, yeah? 
you might have to scroll a bit uh, below. Um, is there any questions that you would like to answer? Tony, do you want to go first? Sorry? Tony, do you want to go first? Answer question? Answer, yeah. In the live comment no? section. You want me to go first? Sorry, I didn't get a line chop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, you yeah. want me to go first? Okay. Oh, you want me to go? It doesn't matter. I mean, any anyone is okay, fine. Go. Since B yeah. comes before M, so biomedical versus medical part. Uh, I'm just joking. You, you have to <laughs> scroll down until you see um, topics related to biomedical science. Okay, yeah, I got some engineering ones. So. <laughs> 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 Having just admitted that I got no face at all. For this. Yeah, okay. hang on a sec. Going down. Oh, um, okay. 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 First one. Um, Question from Just Amir. I, I, oh, okay, I, I, yeah. um, sorry, which, which one do you want to start with? There's EduVisor saying, um, oh, all right, okay, sorry. Uh, where, where are we starting? Amir, I, I can ask, I'll ask you the Amir, question. Amir, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're both the same thing. Okay, Amir, okay, so can biomedical science lead to medicine? How about medical biotechnology? So you want me to start? Yeah, yeah go, ahead, go ahead. Shall I start? Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, by all, yeah, it can. I mean, in Australia, for example, I think medicine is a postgraduate course, so you're required to actually study a degree, um, a first degree, like biomedical science, before you actually do um, do do medicine. So, um, and yeah, I know many graduates in Bristol who uh, successfully obtained their uh, degree in biomedical science and then went on. On, on to do medicine, and in some way, it you can it can lead to a shorter but quite intensive um, um, a d degree in, in medicine. To to not necessarily have to to complete the same number of years that a a school leaver would, um, but it, it would be extremely more inten um, intensive. But it will provide you with many of the basic medical sciences, which you'll cover again when you you're your um, doing medicine and, and in which then which is why some medical degrees means you don't have to do all the uh, study all the biomedical sciences again uh by uh, medical biotechnology medicine um just like what tony was saying in in the, in the united states um medicine is a graduate degree postgraduate degree where you are required to do a bachelor degree before you before they can accept you and and there are a lot of cases where you know undergraduates who have a medical biotechnology actually progress to uh, medicine in in the u.s and in malaysia you can do the same thing and just just like what tony was saying um if you have a, a prior degree in either biomedical science or medical biotechnology it actually helps you when you're you're doing your your medical courses why because a lot of the core principles um, are taught in both these BM and MB. And so, so the, the students in actuality may be ahead of the medical students as well because they know a lot more, especially in biomedical science where you learn the organ systems already, right, Tony? You already learn yeah. the organ systems yeah. in biomedical science. And in biotechnology, you learn about the genomics. You learn about how, how the data generated from genomics was processed you know because right now in medicine you know da data analytics coming up with digital uh, health this is the key this is key now so so i, I completely agree with tony having a, a prior degree in biomedical science or medical biotechnology well can only <clears throat> can only give you a, uh, an advantage <clears throat> before you enter into medicine not saying that you know everybody should take this route, but I'm saying that it's uh, you you get more of a satisfaction and you re you probably will become a better rounded physician when you have both of these um, uh, disciplines in, uh, integrated into your degree. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, you'll be you'll be a higher educated uh, doctor and highly paid as well. Well, <laughs> I take note of the audience. I, I 
you pay, I'll pay. Okay, next question. Yeah. So which one would you like to take? Um, so is it my turn? We just go bounce and back and forth, Tony? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll take one and then you, you take want? the next one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you okay, let's see. let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, so long, I'll just go down. So a question from Tom Daniel. Tom Daniel. Okay, so I'll um, I'll just talk about the 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 from the medical biotechnology perspective. So he asked, "What what do you enjoy about this field?" Huh, let's see. What do I enjoy about medical biotechnology? Okay, so let's uh, I'll, I'll answer this way, Tom. As a medical biotechnologist, um, as I showed you in my slide before, medical bio uh, medical biotechnology is a huge umbrella, and toxicology is a little segment of that umbrella. So I will talk to you about the toxicology perspective and then the medical biotechnology perspective. So from the toxicology perspective, like I shared with you guys in my slides, uh, my interest is in how carbon monoxide, which is produced in our bodies, how that can be toxic in the outside world, which is kind of strange, right? And, and so uh, carbon monoxide is produced every time a red blood cell is broken down, which is every day, every second in our bodies. And in the process of hemoglobin breakdown, carbon monoxide is released. And this carbon monoxide can do a lot of things in our bodies. Now, now all of you learn from biology. Our body doesn't produce something that is toxic to us. Why should it? Right? Why should you make something like toxic in your body? So, so my colleagues um, in the U.S. and and my graduate student here in IMU right now, what we actually do, working on the fact that this carbon monoxide, inhaled carbon monoxide, there are two forms. I'm going to talk about the inhaled. That is actually used as a antibacterial uh, molecule. So, so basically, what happens is if you inhale carbon monoxide, I'm just simplifying it. If you inhale carbon monoxide, pure low dose carbon monoxide, which I have in, in my lab right now, when you inhale that, you will help your body's immune system fight off infection. Okay? So, not only have I shown it, other people in US, China, and Australia, and in Germany have shown it. And, and not only is it antibacterial, it all also helps us receive uh, or promote graft tolerance. When you get a transplanted organ, you have to take anti-graft rejection uh, medication. So what's going on in the US right now, the clinical trial where inhaled pure low-dose carbon monoxide actually helps our body accept this organ, okay? So we recover faster, we accept this organ, and we don't have to take all these toxic anti-graft uh, rejection molecules. Uh, drug. Okay, so that's the toxicological point. And then the DNA point, the genomic medical biotechnology point is just what we are talking about today. You know, we're creating a vaccine from a spike protein. I've, I've, I mean, I actually see this in sci-fi movies. We're actually experiencing it now. I mean, it's amazing. So this is how far medical biotechnology has come. For vaccine development, it takes years. This took less than six months. So why did it only take less than six months? Because biotechnology has progressed to the point where we're using computers, we're using artificial intelligence, we're using bacteria and yeast, we're using all these, and also plants. I haven't even talked about plants. We're using all these living organisms to push the development of vaccine. So that is why I enjoy this field so much. All right. Okay. Let's so, see. yeah. Why do you enjoy biomedical science? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably covered that point in, in my second slide. Basically, I had this love for histology and that, that expanded. And uh, basically, as an academic, you, um, you, you become interested in all aspects of science. Um, so, perhaps we, we'd better move on to some of the other questions. Otherwise, we'll still be on, on okay. question two by you know, four, four o'clock. Okay. Let's just go down there. Let's go okay. down this game. Okay? All right, all right. Okay. okay, the next question is from Lena Ali. Mm -hmm. 
how do you set the ethics when it comes to genetics and medical biotech? Huh? That's a complicated, <laughs> complex one. Okay. Um, okay. The best example to use is gene editing. Okay. I'm sure everybody has heard of the the China case where the the researcher who is not a doctor or a medical biotechnologist. He's, he's from a different profession. We're not going to mention names, but he actually performed gene editing in a set of twins, Lulu and Nana. Okay, and what he did was he promised um, a couple, this couple, you know, poor couple, uh, the the father, the father had had HIV. So when they were expecting the twins, this couple. Um, uh, was advised by this researcher uh, that he can actually prevent the, the twins from ever getting HIV, which is a patent lie, right? And because he wanted to use them to test his, use them as uh, the first human cases of gene editing. So what he did was he gene edited a inflammatory gene, CCR5, and that gene plays a role in the inflammatory process during HIV, but it doesn't cure them from HIV. So he successfully gene edited this particular protein, uh, gene out from the twins and then made this huge announcement uh, late, October, uh, late October 2018. And then the genome world went crazy because nobody can gene edit human beings or any human type of cells. So, so I think that is a really, really important ethical case to show to to showcase actually, and and so I'll go back to the question, ethics in medical biotechnology. So based on that, they've actually stopped all um, human gene editing processing, um, embryonic wise, not adults. Adults is okay because adults, you can actually gene edit disease out. So there are a lot of uh, things going on right now with especially lung cancer, the clinical trials, gene editing a specific lung cancer out of adults. But you go back and say, if you gene edit something in, in the womb, in utero, you are actually playing God, right? It's like saying, I want, to, I want my baby to have blue eyes, fair skin, and blonde hair. That is possible, right? So where is the ethics? There is an international ethics committee globally that oversees all this. That's why they decided no embryonic uh, human gene editing. Um, but each country, and, and, and Tony can talk a little bit about that, each country has their own ethical boards as well. Like for instance, in IMU, every time a research project is proposed, it has to go through our ethics committee mm. right it has to be approved by by the ethics committee in every institution academic institution who then will abide by the rules set by the country's ethical governing board so so uh lena ali don't worry it's on the on the <laughs> it's in good hands because if they can stop gene editing in humans and babies <laughs> two years ago i think it'll be fine all right. Okay. So, would you like to move on to the next uh, couple more questions? I think we can scroll down. We have more questions from students. Okay. I, I think well, let's give Tony a chance to yeah. answer the question. <laughs> okay. So the next question is from Jazz. Does biomedical science involve physics or just biology? No, not really. I mean, if you wanted to work in the hospital uh, involving physics, then it's usually the the operating theatres and the radiology department, which are more physics orientated. So these are the health professions, uh, which you require um, physics backgrounds. But no, not really. Not not in biomedical science. Not not in, um, not physics. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Biomedical sciences fear physics. I I know I feared physics when I was in school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody 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 fears physics. Everybody fears physics. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what's the next one? We're not talking about engineering students here. Okay, the next one. Um, let's we'll go back to the top right before jazz. 
question from Zulaika. Yeah. What type of jobs are available for graduates from medical biotechnology and do they only work in a lab? Okay, um, I, I mean, the simple response is there are a lot of jobs, okay? And, and um, they don't only work in the lab, they work elsewhere. And one of the best ways to answer this question is not to talk about what is out there for medical biotechnology. I'm gonna share with all of you where our graduates go. Okay, then, you, then it gives you a real world um, appreciation of medical biotechnology as a, pro, as a degree program. Okay. There are four categories. The first is quality and re regulatory affairs. So we've had graduates who are working as patent associates, quality assurance associates, and regulatory affairs associates. Then we have entrepreneurship, or what you call um, the, the business end. Uh, our students actually went on to do their MBA and became directors and managing directors of their own company. Okay, mm -hmm. we actually have uh, three right now who are in uh, who are in that position. Then, then we have the labs. We have research and development. So some of our graduates are chemists, medical technicians, lab technicians, senior clinical trial associates, diagnostic lab executives and research officers. And then we have the business development end where we have graduates who are in project management. We have um, a regular, I can't remember the email writing. <laughs> we have business managers, we have data analysts, you know, big data and senior key account managers. So, so I've just read out a variety of jobs from very, very different areas that gives you a flavor of where IMU, uh, IMU medical biotechnology graduates go into. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, there are tons of jobs. You just have to uh, ask us to help you look for them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's answer a couple more questions, professors. I think we have a few left. Um, perhaps maybe um, Professor both would like to pick up anything? Yeah, well, I guess we're working our way down the list and then later we yeah. could always send uh, um, some written responses to the, the questions we didn't get uh, time to answer. So Sun Lee has asked, asked, I've heard that Malaysia has very limited jobs for biomed stroke biotech degree holders. And those who have a master's related to biology must likely, most likely end up in ac as academics here. Um, it's not so bad, but anyway. uh, should this be should this be a concern for those wanting to go into the field of human biology? Well, no. I mean, I, I go back to my previous argument: is that you shouldn't consider your first degree as a guarantee as to where it's going to find you a job. You should go into it with a mindset that it is going to expose you to different areas, mm. some of which you will. Um, have great enthusiasm for. If you have great enthusiasm for a subject, you find a way of, of uh, making a living from it and um, being successful. So, the you should. It's um, if you're looking for a career for life, you need to find something which you love doing, um, and then uh, pursue that as a career. So. No, I, I don't think it's uh, a limitation. That there's a range of different fields. Bi biomedical sciences in, in the hospitals is changing all the time. In the UK, um, the biomedical scientists are gradually um, doing many of, the, many of the jobs which the pathologists uh, um, used to do. And this um, change transcends internationally these days so what's happening in one country tends to happen in another country because it makes usually because it makes economic sense usually. <laughs> um, and then besides working in hospitals there's a range of other jobs open to biomedical uh, scientists and uh, uh, biotechnology degree holders uh, as BY just mentioned um, um, product specialists working for big companies like Leica mm -hmm. Rosh, diagnostics, get to travel the world. Well, when there isn't that pandemic, that is. Um, and so on. So, so no, I, I, 
anybody who has a passion for one area of science or indeed um, interest should should really pursue it um, and they usually be successful at it. So that's my advice. All right. Okay. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a solid advice for those of you who are considering or not sure or fearing for limitations. There's always room if you have passion and you want to pursue it no matter what. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think we've uh, would you like to pick up one more last question? I think we have one from Melina. Um, I think this one is related to your uh, slides just now, but insulin ah. based. Yeah. Okay, okay Melina, I'm, I'm looking. Well, the Melina and Sarah's question can I'm going to integrate them. Okay, so it gives uh, Sarah a chance to to have a question answered as well. All right, because it's, it's very close. So, um, so Melina has asked a question: Is there are there similarities between yeast-based insulin and regular insulin in terms of function? The answer is no. And, and that goes to the, bio, the, the heart of biotechnology is we can use any living organism. Um, so as long as we, have, we understand the structure of, of bacteria and the structure of viruses, now, um, structure of bacteria and yeast. Remember, one is a eukaryote and one is a prokaryote. So prokaryote are, if you remember in biology, you know, these are bacteria and then eukaryotes are yeast, which is very similar to mammalian cell. So we, uh, medical biotechnologists, will use the genetic machinery of both bacteria and yeast to make this particular gene, which is the insulin gene, right? So we are able to harness bacteria or yeast, or even we can even do the same thing with parasites. I'm not saying we should go out and do it. I'm just saying we can use parasites, use the parasitic genetic machinery to make human insulin. But it's easier with yeast because yeast are not infected, right? Mm -hmm. And certain bacteria are not infected. So we would like to use the most benign organism, which are yeast and bacteria, to then use them as protein factories to make insulin. Now, Based on that, remember I was talking about uh, there is a place in, in Johor, Nusa Jaya, Johor, that is actually doing this right now, the, uh, making yeast derived insulin. So Sarah, I'm gonna answer your question. There is R&D, R&D in, in terms of that, uh, that particular industry, the yeast derived insulin industry. Mm -hmm. there are, we also have industry partners like, uh, I'm gonna go mention their names because I'll probably get get uh, in trouble. We also have industry partners and so does biomedical science have industry partners where we send our students to do their internship and their practical training and they actually, if they do really well, they're actually going to be hired, right? So, so we have a lot of research and development technology in Malaysia, but it's not really well advertised. I don't know why. I really don't know why. And and I and if you look on Job Street, there are tons of jobs. But whether or not um, we are pushing for the, the progression of medical biotechnology or medical, biomedical science, it's really up to the individual. Just like Tony says, if you have the passion for it, you will go and look for it. Yeah. Tony Tony went through many many places in the UK. He went from job to job. He learned from each institution. And I went from job to job. I learned from every academic institution and then we marry it to become who we are today. Mm -hmm. We integrate it. So, so there are a lot of opportunities. It's just whether you want to do it. You know, right. do you want to get off the couch? <laughs> do you want to go out? Or do you want to just sit in front of your laptop during the MCO or CMCO and just do everything on your laptop? And I'll give you an example. I am actually at my place of work right now because I wanted to get myself out of my apartment to do something. Right? Why? Because it's different. You know, two months at home is drive you crazy, right, Tony? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, not going crazy. Yeah. So, so, you know, <laughs> um, so I, you know, like I said, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a vet, but Right now, I'm not. Why? Because our passion changes as our experiences go along. Yeah. Right? So it happened to Tony. It happened to me. So when people come in, 
for their first degree, just exactly mm -hmm. like what I'm saying, that doesn't define who you are as an individual. Yeah. That yeah. actually lays the groundwork for you to then go to the next level because you need the platform. You need the, the you need the knowledge of what it is for a basic undergraduate degree. So so just like what was Tony was saying in the U.S. in the U.K. medicine or maybe not U.K. <laughs> medicine is a graduate degree, and the reason why they they want it to be a graduate degree because they need the the prospective medical students to have an understanding of what it takes to get the undergraduate, yeah. the process, the training that is required. Because you learn how to manage time, you learn how to prioritize, you learn how to work on a team, you learn how to manage and lead, mm -hmm. right? So that's what happens. So I hope, uh, I hope uh, Melina and Sarah have answered your question. Yeah, yeah, actually I think there was a, a very, very insightful and you know, from your perspective of like going through biomedical from the beginning until where you are today, I think you might have inspired a lot of our audience today. Um, but we've come to the end of our session. Thank you so much, Professor Rose and Professor Chin for being here. Uh, we hope that we get to see you again for our next webinar session. Um, yeah, you want to share the last slide where we have- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Where students can actually- Yes, yes, yes. All right, so for all of our students um, and also our audience who are watching, if you have any information or if any questions, uh, you have looked at your education and your education path or even career path, don't hesitate to contact IMU. Their contact details are there. Or you can go ahead on IMU uh, booth at our education virtual fair today. They'll be here until tomorrow. So do not miss this opportunity to grab this chance and plan out your education career. Yeah? And and I'm sure Tony and I will welcome your your inquiries. You, you, you can- For sure. There we go. <laughs> yeah, right where you want. We, we, we're quite happy to answer any queries. Yeah, yeah. You can email Edu Advisor or the IMU um, link there, and they will direct questions to us. Yes. All right. Thank you okay. so much for coming to us. Thank you. Okay. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. All right. So there you have it. There you have. Um, Professor Chin and Professor Rhodes from IMU talking about micro, uh, sorry, biomedical technology and biomedical sciences. Up next, we have um, we have our speaker from Harewat University. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Hu, uh, who will be speaking about mechanical engineering and what it entails in the new normal. So, if you're interested in pursuing mechanical engineering, be sure to stay tuned as we begin shortly. Yeah, uh, and those of you who just joined our webinar session, welcome. Uh, we have an exciting one of our speakers who will be weighing in on a variety of topics such as power of machinery, uh, biotechnology, mechanical engineering, and dentistry. So actually, we already have Dr. Steven in the stream. Let me just pull him up real quick. Hi, Hi Nina. Dr. Steven. Hi. Paul is here. Hi. Hi. Thank, you for, thank you for being here today. Um, thank let you. me just uh, do a quick introduction for those who just streamed in our um, webinar series. Um, welcome and good evening. So what we do here is that our webinar series is part of our um, Edu Advisor Virtual Education Fair, where academicians and industry professionals will bring in a number of topics, ranging from choosing an education pathway to job and career. I'm your host, my name is Nina, and today we have Dr. Stephen Hill, Assistant Professor at the School of Engineering and Physical Sciences from Harold Watt University, Malaysia, will be sharing with us about navigating the new normal with mechanical engineering. So just a quick background about our esteemed speaker today. Uh, Dr. Stephen Ho is a chartered engineer registered with the Engineering Council UK under the Institution of Mechan sorry, Mechanical Engineers and a professional engineer under the Board of Engineers in Malaysia. So holding a both degree and a PhD in mechanical engineering in seven years of teaching experience under his belt, Dr. Stephen was awarded a bronze medal in the International University Carnival on e-learning and exemplary meritorious academic staff in 2016 for his innovative teaching approach. Now, he is the assistant professor at the School of Engineering and Physical Sciences from Harriet Watt University, Malaysia. Thank you, doctor, for joining us today. 
Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, how are you? How are you, doctor? Um, feeling fantastic. How has the MCO treating you? I think we've all been cooped up at home for a while. At the start itself, it's not uh, it's not easy. But mm -hmm. looking forward to grabbing uh, is the challenge as the opportunity, so we can do much more uh great things and impacted the world in a different way. So looking forward to a lot of fabulous and fantastic ideas out there. All right. Okay. So for those of you who are watching right now, if you have any questions for um, Dr. Steven, please leave in the comment section below, either on Facebook, YouTube, or on FAIR. And we will get to it at the end of the session. And if you have any questions about um, your education uh, career, please do not hesitate to visit Harriet Watts booth at our virtual FAIR. Um, Dr. Steven, are you ready to share your presentation? Yes. All right, so you can just share your screen. All right, here it is. All right, so Dr. Steven, you may take it away. Okay, thank you, Nina. So, uh, hi, everyone. For today, I would like to talk something about the new normal of mechanical engineering. So let, before I begin, here I would like to have a short form of the mechanical engineer as ME, me. The reason for that, actually, I want to bring you to a journey with me. Imagine right now you are a mechanical engineer and what we will, for, we will experience throughout the journey with me. So let's begin. So first of all, what is mechanical engineering? So I do encounter a lot of uh, answers from uh, different, different people. And I think you also have your own idea of how to answer this question. What is a mechanical engineering? So first of all, most of the time I will heard, they will say that people who managing machine, they are mechanical engineer. Or some, they might treat it the same as mechanics. Okay. So if you're looking from James Watt, who also in the string line of mechanical engineering, I think definitely he will answer. I can definitely do more than that. So to change your mindset, actually, mechanical engineering not only do that, but we are doing more. OK, and I'm going to share you today. So let's move on example of this. So, you know, everyone have a smartphone. So I have a questions here. So I have a button of A, B, and C, where button is on A, B is for speaker, and C on screen. So I just have a quick question uh, to all of you. What do you think, or which part of it actually mechanical engineering get involved in? So perhaps you're just taking yourself around 10 seconds, and if you're interested, you can type in the chat box on the, your options of answer. Okay, so this is an interesting example, even for me during my young age. So someone asked me, do you know whether mechanical engineer do anything on this device itself? To give you the answer, A, B, or C, they all are the answer as the job scope for mechanical. So the button itself here, that definitely related to the mechanical mechanism on how you're going to press it and talking about the lifespan of the button and the, and the components involved in. The speaker, we talk about the vibration, and even some talk about the heat transfer when you keep hearing the sound from the star, from the, the person next to it. And the screen. So interestingly, screen, definitely we talk about the strength. We talk about whether how we can withstand and the material selection to withstand any of the strength uh, fa uh, failure and whether it will break easily. So this one, I hope that it will give you an idea as anything in our home we are there to help to design and to work on it. So USB, ergonomic design, tablet durability, smartphone heat transfer, laptop ventilation, mouse dynamics, all this actually requires the expertise from a mechanical engineer. Hope that gives you some insight. To move on further, actually we are not limited. So I just introduced some of the fields to name which commonly uh, we have a lot of questions from, uh, from students, from parents. So actually, which particular fields are in the job career for mechanical engineering? So we do have robotics, construction, renewable energy, oil and gas, transportation, even military and defense. And of course, we have many more to do. If I may start, for example, like construction, I think most of you are familiar with the words M and E 
which stands for mechanical and electrical. So we are doing a lot of consultation uh, work where we will do design and to name a few of the works for mechanical, we will do a lot of uh, ventilation. We will talk about uh, how we're going to design the air conditioning system. How about the water pump flow? Okay, how are you going to get water and pump up the, the sanitary? And also fire protection is very important. We talk about safety here. And then uh, we also talking about the tank size and the design and also uh, everything that we, we regards to the mechanical aspect, everything will be in the consideration and back to the regulation. The next thing also robotics. I believe a lot of you actually have some concern and because the trend on IR 4.0, people are talking about automation, people are talking about robotics. So here I wanted to give you an example of prosthetic arm or biomechanics. Here we can see that you might be fascinated by how the electrical things works here and there in all and every single aspect. But please remember, mechanical engineer also does in the design. How are you going to design the shape of the arm, the finger mechanism, the motor structure, the alignment of it. Imagine the prosthetic arm you are designing for a child of 10 years old. You need to consider about the usability as the child, the sizing. So all these actually engaging the mechanical expert and the knowledge. So please bear in mind, it's an integrated composition here and not only that we look into the electrical expert. Going next, of course, we cannot run away from automate, automotive. So transportation, automotive or aerospace, mechanical actually cons considered in the design of the shape, talking about aerodynamics, the mechanism of combustion. Of course, we also have the knowledge of CAD, computer aided drawing, how we will do simulation and analytical work before we really prototype the machine itself. So for this one, uh, this is very heavily on the analytical computational work, which please remember, this one also will be uh, done by mechanical engineer. And how about military and defense? What are we doing there? So I know I did know someone actually uh, built or designed missiles. Okay, very interesting. So we learned about the, how the momentum and the projectile motion and of course, we also involved in the design of any unmanned aerial vehicles. I believe right now the UAV is getting popular in terms of surveillance, army, military, and even for agriculture. Next, oil and gas. Not only chemical engineering will be heavily demanded in the oil and gas industry or petroleum engineer, so, so does mechanical engineer. So imagine the piping and the rig, so test rig, everything, you will still need a maintenance and servicing engineers, which are from mechanical. So how are you going to uh, analyze in terms of the lifespan or the failure or the strength of the piping? So everything will be under the control and safety environment. Next, let's talk about renewable energy. I know we have some like wind energy, maybe wind energy is not very uh, commonly used in Malaysia because of the different uh, demography, but our counterpart in UK definitely is popular with the wind energy research. Solar energy is not new, but we're also engaging with a lot of research and mechanical engineering also looking forward into the design, how to have a flexible solar panel to, be, to optimize the absorption of solar energy and changing into electricity. So here you can see on the right most, uh, there is a happy cafe to take note of the picture. So this is actually a cafe, cafe in our campus. And this is related to a work which is on the biogas renewable energy. Looking forward in, we have students actually doing research together with the lecturer researchers, how they can build a biodigester. So what is this actually? So giving a little bit more in, uh, inputs is, have you noticed about the waste of food? So what is the results eventually or what you're gonna do afterwards with the waste of food? So here biogas actually utilizing the waste and turn it into something useful, a gas, which is a methane gas, 
and then utilizing it as uh, energy for cooking and for other applications. And here I also listed out some of the applications uh, for as a mechanical engineer, manufacturing, machinery, packaging, advanced materials. So machinery, I don't think is new. It's talking about a lot of automation here. And advanced materials, if you heard about things like smart material, so a lot of researcher or mechanical engineering does uh, a lot of works on the inventing or studying more materials so that we can design in a lot of different, uh, adapting to the different environment and also for different aspect and technology. Now, you kind of know what actually mechanical engineer does. So how about in these few years, what can you be? So this one, we give you a general idea what we expect and what kind of a level that you will have. Imagine you have a smooth progressive gen uh, in the career progression. So you might be starting for the first earlier five years. You had a fresh engineer or executive. You can go into a senior engineer or senior executive in another 10 years time. Then after that, you will be promoted to the staff engineer and principal engineer, and eventually you can be a GM general manager or a custodian engineer. Of course, not only that, if you are interested to pursue in your educational career, just like me, you will start off with teaching or research assistant. Going forward, you become a lecturer, an assistant professor, and then you will be associate professor and professor. So this one, we would like to give you a simple idea what to expect in terms of your career progression. Now, the highlights. What is the new normal? And how is a mechanical engineer going to be affected by the IR 4.0? So let's look into it. Now, first of all, let me share you the engineer population in Malaysia. We are talking about a little bit also the statistics. We actually, as a country, we will benchmark and looking into the ratio, something called the advanced nation benchmark ratio, which talking about how many engineers to how many population in terms of the community in a country. As a target or developed country, actually, we are looking forward to have a one to 100 ratio. So meaning that we should have one engineer in every 100 of Malaysian. And looking to the current uh, population, the latest that I retrieved by yesterday is 32.37 million people in Malaysia. Hmm, interesting fact. And then with uh, uh, the interesting other uh, data that I can gather from the Board of Engineer Malaysia, for your information, Board of Engineer Malaysia is the authority, uh, the legal, that looking into the professionalism and ethics of, uh, of an engineers in Malaysia. So currently, uh, rounded up around, we have 160,000 uh, of registered engineers. If we do a simple math here, I think you will roughly know that we got around 1 to 200. So this one is giving you the idea, our current status is we are still lack of engineers. With more supporting documents and data, in some of the reports, we can see that even though we backdated on the 2006, but looking into the trend, if you can see, mechanical engineering actually has the most highly demanded in the line of future. And according to STAR, we have a short of 50,000 experienced engineers, actually. And from the straight new straight times, the top five emerging careers, and I know, again, a lot of you are talking about robotics. And here, I would like to give you the quote is, mechanical is actually one of the entry level academic requirement for a career in robotics. And the current uh, news regarding the post COVID. So everyone is talking about what's going to happen after the COVID. Will I going to get the job? And how about talking about uh, five years down the road? So I'm a SPM student, I'm an IGSCST student, or I'm actually a pre-U student right now, and I want to register myself to study undergraduate. What I'm going to do, am I going to still have a job in future when I graduate? So looking into the far future of four to five years. And here we have summarized some of the job generating sectors. Looking into the tense here, as easy as like healthcare, frontliners and broader care work, global medical supplies. 
I know some of you might thinking, okay, this is talking about medical and how does it affect or relink to a mechanical engineers? Please remember as a mechanical engineer, we can do more than that. For example, here, I just want to show you an earlier initiative, actually, even as our students, Hero even put the initiative alongside with the frontliners as an engineer, he can 3D print something we call them facial mask uh, buckler, buckles. If you know, notice that if we wear the mask for a long uh, period of time, you will feel a little bit uneasy okay, throughout the back of the ears, isn't it? So for this one, the design is very simple. It's just a buckle that actually you can tie the, the, the string along and with a buckle, it will, much, it will feel much uh, more comfortable for long-term use. And not only that, in the medical side as well, we are talking about how we can uh, doing some disinfection technologies, how you can um, integrating, talking about um, delivering the medical supplies to rural area. As a mechanical engineer, you can do more in helping and supporting that kind of uh, initiatives. And food supplies. Many of you are also talking about, okay, current trend, we talk about a lot of e-business, we talk about marketing, we buy online stuff, and everyone is looking into the aspect of uh, online. Then how about engineers here? So are we still going to have job and prospect later on? Think about the back ends there. Now, because of the transition, a lot of food packing, okay? So you definitely going to have a lot of materials of packaging, the designing of the freezing freezer for the portability for long-term use. So all this comes, uh, mechanical engineer comes into uh, the aspect in the design and also in the in the study of how to build a better and more advanced technologies on for these different different new applications. Now, not all, but I just give you some ideas of what are the few important skills that some of you might look up, might be foreseeing how to how to work if as an engineer right now when you have to do it remotely, right? So a lot of works uh, and thinking is a lot of application will be re I mean manpower will be replaced by automation and how mechanical engineering going to survive in that scenario. So. Automation definitely is talking about robotics and how we can actually manage it is we, if you remember, we are the brain to design and automate the system. We are the one who are going to control and design and set all the requirements for the failure and how do we analyze and talk about and knowing when the material will fail and how the production line need to be improved and optimized. So that's why we are still important and knowing that the skills part of it, control, the understanding of how you can do optimization is very important in this case. The next one, mechanical design. So we have a role to link between physicals and technology together. So example like 3D printing, all this, we are talking about how we can improvise and enhance the technology for further applications such as in biomedical uh, related biotechnology and building, for example, artificial heart and kidney and so on and so forth. And also important skills that definitely you can do your work remotely in computational analysis. You see a lot of times when we have a new uh, products, we will not come to a jump to a conclusion talking about manufacturing prototyping it we definitely will do some simulation analysis and here is your skills to shine where you can use simulation and as an analytic uh, advisory you can actually consult and give the uh, report of how the performance of the design that you the client would like to propose and this one will give a very very pre hit up of the idea whether the product will work or not so this one is inclusive of your final element analysis. It's also talking about computational uh, fluid uh, dynamics. Not only that, in the world, actually, if you are familiar, if you are not, maybe I can introduce you something called the Sustainable Goal, uh, goal Development as uh, Sustainable Development Goal SDG. 
So we have a total of 17 and you can see that actually each of each one of them is a very important components and it's very significant obvious that number nine, innovation infrastructure, 11, sustainable cities and communities. These are example of the field that we are going, we are exploring and how we can do something new and better, fast, simple, easy in uh, for better enhancement in our technology and our for development. A lot of us are combining right now, especially we integrated all these uh, elements and aspects and fields into a smart city development. Now, you have definitely know the ideas of what do you, what you can do, okay, what are the fields that are waiting for me, and definitely you need to have all those things and including your academic excellency. So, um, we are very, it is very important that you are ready for it with academic excellence, talking about ABC. As easy as ABC, but definitely the grading here is not as easy as it seems. So we are looking for people who are passionate in physics and mathematics into in the engineering field. Not only that, looking into the IR 4.0 and also the post-COVID scenario, we are actually looking forward on how to build your skills and prepare yourself in talking about resilience. How are you going to be vulnerable and be robust in terms of um, whatever changes and uncertainties that in the future. Today, you gonna, I mean, today we are seeing the COVID. Are you, do you know, or are you going to expect there will be no more of such things? So no one knows what is gonna happen tomorrow, but we have to make sure that we are resilient. We are adaptable to the new changes. Emotional intelligence, talking about how you can balance between the well beings here. And of course, innovative thinking. So knowing that innovation actually linked to well-being of happiness. So how you're going to be uh, creating new things and to actually give you added value and impact to the community and the world. And uh, last but not least, leadership. You know, to share you some, some uh, interesting thought is, um, Leadership is so important that when you go for a job interview, a lot of times leadership is something that they are looking for. So a lot of people have a lot, uh, I mean, on average, they can get a lot of high scores, but to have a built-in or inner leadership skills and talent is not easy. In that sense, that's why leadership always started from yourself on how you're going to know and lead yourself. That is the first leadership skills that we are talking about. Of course, in advance, then you will start to go for the as a team. I know a lot of you working as a, in assignment in group projects, you already started to experience what is something called leading a team. Not only that, have you ever imagined how can you lead the communities? How can you going to do something that impacting the communities and giving a lot of positive uh, and impact? And in Harawad University, we not only want to produce uh, an engineers, we want and also want to support uh, the next and future uh, the job uh, provider leading by leading an enterprise here. And this one, we will be actually engaging with six the do six domains under some a program called the Empower Program. And if you are interested to know more, please let us know and uh, please visit our booth. Now, knowing everything interesting about mechanical engineer, the question very direct to yourself is, how do you know whether you like mechanical engineering? Right? So I'm not so sure how many of you actually thought of this or asked these questions. I believe some of you, even for myself last time in during my, my young age, I will feel like, I, why do I need to think about this? Right? So uh, as long as I graduate and I can find a job, um, that's all. But nowadays, it's not easy. We are looking for people with purpose. And of course, the first thing is talking about passion and interest. If you have a passion and you have interest, definitely you will achieve a higher, uh, you can strike very high. And of course, you need to 
not hit maths. Okay, so it's the best if you can perform very well in your mathematics, but definitely not to hit your maths. Physics, you need to love your physics. You're going to have a lot of physics uh, theories and everything inside. So as an engineer, mathematics and physics are the very, very important element and causes uh, and knowledge that we, we would like to we like you to have. And on top of that as well, you need to be someone creative. As an engineer, we don't expect you as uh, just to apply what you know, but the creativity comes in in how you can use the same concept, but to implement it into a higher level and extend it to a different uh, scope of work applications and might even come up with a generous solution for everything, a universal solution. And of course, presentation. No matter how good are you in, in terms of intelligence, you need to be able to present yourself well. You need to be able to convey the message, clear, straight to point, concise, precise. So a lot of times when we see graduates, it's, it's hard for them to actually uh, present themselves. Pre they, they do have a brilliant, brilliant and superb ideas, but they just can't present it in a very, very well manner. It makes the things lost in attachment and contact. So these are a few things that we are looking in you. So here, actually, I would like to conclude is worry not about the job, but focus whether you are future proof. I believe we here actually able to support you in talking about the, all the six domains, talking about your intelligence, the knowledge that you need, and uh, the skills, the new skill set that we will help you to develop together. So thank you. Stay safe and healthy. Together we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen, for your presentation. I think it was very enlightening when we talked about mechanical engineering and for those who are interested in mechanical engineering itself. Um, let's go and answer some questions. Doctor, can you see at the side, there's a uh, panel? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, we can actually scroll down some more because I think the previous one will form the previous um, uh, webinar sessions. Okay, cool. I think we have some people who actually answered like your first initial question about the smartphone. <laughs> yes, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to see they, will, they, they have their own options and opinion on one person. Cool. All right, so uh, let's pick up the first question uh, from Kieran Lee, shall we? Okay, sure. So Kieran Lee, uh, the question that he got is, do you think mechanical engineers will become obsolete because of automation and AI? Mm -hmm. So uh, as shared in my presentation just now, and also I would like to add if any, um, definitely no. Okay, so automation is just uh, a medium, I would say it's a medium or mechanism to do things which is a routine base. Mm -hmm. But to us as a mechanical engineers, we are looking forward into uh, coming up, as, as mentioned just now, we are the brain actually. We are the one who connecting the dots and making things optimized and efficient. Even you have artificial intelligence. Um, yes, I know that there's a, there's a fact that saying that AI beat the chess master and things like that. So yes, definitely, yes, AI will learn. But uh, in certain fact itself, we are adapted to changes. So human and as engineers at expertise with our uh, expertise here, your knowledge actually can do faster and more than that. So we are the one who will create the algorithm and we talk about how we optimize and control the system here. So we are the one who will be able to observe clearly and see any changes on any mechanism. For example, if we think about automation in production line, so we will definitely able to identify changes required in the settings and everything through observation and experience. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you uh, read some books or knowing that for, um, there's a story behind like, um, there's a client actually looking for an engineer, uh, someone to actually fix the, the machine, the engine. So after a long run of it, it doesn't, it doesn't fix. And he hired this person and this person actually just go to the machine and just use a simple hammer and knock on the machine. And the thing just run and everything works well. So he actually built the, the the factory manager, uh, which are high lumps on cost. And they actually argue, why do you, it's just a simple hammering. 
Why does it cost so much? So it's very simple. The pay is not about the work. It's pay is about the experience that we gather and the intelligence that you have as an engineer. So that's why in the conclusion, I will say that we will definitely not obsolete. It's just a matter of how we will improvise and make things better. And we are the one who will be developing and designing a new and more advanced technology. So it's so all that, about innovation then? It's all about innovation. Correct, correct. Yes, uh, if you're looking into the trend right now, um, we also need to engage a lot of the elements in terms of innovation. And, mm. and a lot of them actually will be moving forward to entrepreneurship as well. So mm. not as just a pure engineer, you'll be going for the management level, you will be going for business related, but definitely the skills and the intelligence is still uh, a fundamental uh, requirement, the skill sets that we cannot lose. Mm. All right, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Steven, and I hope that Kieran understood that message. Let's move on to Razman Yusuf. Randy, I'm going to bring it into the screen. Sure, thank you. So, uh, Razman Yusuf, I have a question. Do you have any advice for someone about to study mechanical engineering? Um, advice here, I will just say, uh, welcome on board. <laughs> welcome to the mechanical engineering career. Um, you will um, I believe you will be um, stay tuned and looking for the fantastic uh, journey of being a mechanical engineering. So uh, it's hard for me to identify uh, talking about what advice I can give you unless you can specify in terms of what I expect here. But uh, looking for if let's say talking about as an undergraduate and uh, your interest is really into mechanical engineering, uh, looking forward to please um, please make sure you do well in your studies and looking into what kind of career, I mean, career prospect or application you want. Are you talking about you want to work in a very industry related to air conditioning? Are you talking about into the fire safety uh, industry? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about in the um, medical side of consultation firm? So once you identify on our course, you can, you will be able to know it when you went through an internship, definitely. So, but if you can plan ahead in the future on this, you will know what kind of minor causes or optional causes to select in your, in your study. That's one. Also, uh, please uh, build your soft skills, especially your presentation, your teamwork skills, and please join some activities that can um, enhance to improve your leadership capability. So, I, I mean, it's not really a fake story. I really uh, gone through that process knowing that in people or industry, they will see new one thing is your leadership and how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. A certificate of excellence actually definitely will help you to enter the door for interview. But eventually, right after that, when you sit down, ask, answering and presenting yourself, that is another different story. So, I will conclude is uh, please know what uh, is your vision, what you envision mm -hmm. you yourself in uh, four to five years time, what, where is the area that you want to work with, and then uh, please improve and enhance your soft skills. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think that maybe, I don't know, perhaps they don't think that in mechanical engineering, you need to have a soft skill, but you need a lot of clients, it's a lot of um, other fields that you need to connect with to do your job. So that's why having soft skills is actually very, very important in mechanical engineering. It's not just Correct. about having knowledge in it, right? Yes, you're right, you're right. All right. Um, we have another question here from Linda Yi. She's asking about robotics. I'm just gonna like this in. Okay, so Linda Yi uh, has a question on, does mechanical engineering include robotics? Can I go into robotics with a mechanical engineering degree? So for this one, I would, uh, if let's say very specific, you need to know which particular robotics you're talking about. But in general, I would say yes. So in some of the courses actually itself, we have a similar or common kind of uh, element. So you actually have the basis when you study about and mechanical engineering, uh, you have a degree on that. You actually can do a lot of things uh, related to mechanical, even though robotics, Robotics, you might seem to be very, we call it EE based, but if you understand through, through my presentation just now, robotics is not solely from an EE aspect. We also need to integrate with other components uh, from mechanical element. So how are you going to design talking about the strength and the dynamics, talking about the control. So here, mechanical actually will take into uh, the composition of the team that working on this project. So looking, 
to answer whether mechanical can go for robotic field, yes. Mm -hmm. But if let's say you want to really uh, have a higher level kind of uh, specific course that is talking about specific specialization when maybe you can first, uh, further your study in the research on uh, robotics specifically. So in general, uh, my own humble opinion is uh, it's better to do some, uh, I mean, starting with the fundamental of uh, engineering or mechanicals. And e eventually when you graduate, you actually have more uh, opportunities to dive in into the different aspect. So it will give you a more uh, uh, stronger basis and foundation to do a lot more different things. Right, right. All right. Okay. I hope that Linda Yi uh, has taken note about pursuing mechanical engineering and robotics. Um, we have one last question here by Wan Ying asking about being a marine engineer with a mechanical engineering degree and how and is that possible okay um yes it is possible um same thing here um you can actually uh, after studying some change, uh, difference between a marine and mechanical if you understand it is they have a lot of common uh causes as well in this part um there are a few actually engineering uh, fields which require the basis from mechanical. So marine engineer is one of them. And if you really want to talk about, okay, uh, maybe right now I'm not so sure whether I want to be a marine engineer, but I just mm -hmm. want to know if, let's say I choose to study mechanical and then later on, can I go back to marine? If mm -hmm. after the four years or five years, then only I realize, oh, okay, I like marine. So you can, and looking into that, actually there is something called a one-year course of a G, uh, if I remember, it's graduate graduate marine engineer, so GME. So you can actually take that and uh, for you to tra tra transform yourself as a marine engineer. And of course, uh, different country or different uh, uh, organization they have, might have a different name of the courses. So basically, you can actually do things in the marine aspect if you if you have done your mechanical engineering degree. So it's just a matter of branching out into a different uh, uh, field then, yeah? Yes, you're right. All right. Okay. So um, actually, Doctor, I have a personal question. Oh, okay. Also, as I was watching, uh, as I was listening to your slides, it made me, I have questions about robotics and AI in terms of like our future and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any ethical limitations to robotics, automation or AI um, in certain fields? Like for instance, can we see robotics or AI in a hospital setting to replace human labor? Um, if we are looking into the higher level, I would say there will be because example, talking about cloning, cloning mm -hmm. DNA, talking about how robots will change and replacing human, definitely there will be. It's just like uh, a lot of people want to study about the brain and talking about how you can mm -hmm. extract information and keep it like, like for example, like a story in a reservoir. Um, yeah. Definitely, they have uh, ethics on that. But talking about uh, if more on the labor kind of robotics aspect mm. as an automation, I don't think they, I mean, that will be a big issue. Right. So that's why we have to look into the the, the higher, how in-depth is talking about um, we penetrate into the human humankind of stuff. It's on the intelligence. It's talking about the biogenetic stuff, which is a very, yeah. very uh, individual and private uh, related. Right. So I guess you would say that in terms of robotics and automation, it's not impossible for it to penetrate to certain fields, but they won't be, I would say, hogging uh, certain uh, professions. So could it just be like like a helper or like, let's just say like nurses? Because I do see, maybe I'm in and movies, but I do see that there are robotics who can just carry trays or sometimes even the machines that like sort of do laser beams and things like that. Yeah, so I was just like thinking in terms of that. But when it comes to professions like doctors or surgeons, there's no chance that robotics could integrate in that level, right? Um, so far, we can see that um, mainly we use AI robotics as a tool or a system. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it's talking about surgery, everything is also the, in, the one who gave instruction will still mainly from the, the human or the doctors right. or right, the person right, operators. Right. Um, definitely, uh, a lot of work on research is looking forward to automated or on, I mean, uh, I heard like news that we have a change in the lenses of eyes mm. with a automated kind of a surgery. So uh, you see things like this is already started, but if you understand it correctly, this is not 
related to things with ethicals because it's just an operation which um, you are changing things which is do it done it like a, a normal human operation execution part. So that is the part that we have a legal leniency on looking forward talking about the, the range of authority. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you. So I think that answers my question. I feel like I have a clear understanding of robotics in terms of like other, you know, integrating in other professions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stephen, for being with us and answering all of our students' questions. I think people with interest in mechanical engineering has a much uh, better perspective on what it all entails. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for, uh, for hosting the, the session for me. And hope um, all, all the, I mean, the listeners, the participants will be interested in mechanical engineering. And please do, uh, I mean, visit our virtual booth or yeah, actually yeah. Uh, inquiry for any further information that you need. So uh, we definitely need you and uh, the country need you as an engineer here. Thank you. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Steven. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right, so there you have it. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Stephen Hu of Herod Wat University, Malaysia, who just presented uh, about mechanical engineering and how do we navigate it in our new and current situation. Um, up next, we'll have Dr. Ramesh Kumarisan, Associate Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Dentistry at Ames University, who will share with you everything there is to know about dental technologies and the career path to be one. So don't go anywhere and stay tuned for more. In the meantime, let's take a tour at Edu Advisors Virtual Education Fair and visit here at Watt University, Malaysia. So what I'm just going to share my screen right here and we'll take a quick tour at here at Watt University. All right. OK, so there you have it. This is the main booth of here at Watt University. For those of you who haven't been to our fair yet, we have an array of leading universities They'll be at our booth that you can just ask any questions and one of it is here at what university. Now, what you can get from this particular booth is that you can know more about the universities that I'm <clears throat> sorry, that you're interested in. So from their visions and missions, they even talk about their campus, uh, history and also the courses that is that here at what university is offering. Yeah, um, you can also check the courses here. You can see there's an array of courses under Harry Watt University, and you also have the option to just apply right away for free. Do not forget that you can actually just do that on the go. You can also check out the scholarship that, that uh, the universities are offering. So these are the scholarships that Harry Watt University has for those of you who are interested in pursuing your studies in <clears throat> this particular field. Uh, also, a very quick note for um, Harry Watt. Harry Watt has a special um, scholarship called WISE. It's for women in science and engineering. So this scholarship goes from 100 to or 50% tuition waiver for females only for those who are interested in um, pursuing the STEM field among other scholarships that they're offering. And for those of you who are just viewing uh, the fair and you want to bring home information, you can. All you can do is just click on the brochure tag and you can see the list of courses even um, fees and scholarship accommodation and such at the uh, brochure uh, section over here. Now, what happens now is that if you have any questions, you can actually just click the chat now button here, or you can just click the little bell that is over here. Let's just go and click this one here. So what happens now is that if you have any questions or any um, uh, questions about your education uh, career or courses or anything, you can just Fill in your details, uh, your top questions, or you can even write your own question and just start chat. And a counsel will be with you right away. It's important to note that your counselors are not um, robots. They are uh, actual. Um, they are actual people. They are actual uh, professional uh, counselors who will be answering all your inquiries. Um, if you don't know what you want to study, don't worry. We have this tab called quizzes at our fair. All you have to do is just click on it. It will lead you to a few selection of quizzes that you can choose from which pre you should take to discovering your career path or even about your personality yeah? and also if you're prepared for college. So don't worry if you are a um, if you're a student and you don't know if you're ready to embark on this journey or if you just want to uh, start working. It's OK. You can just 
go on and, and click on this quiz. It's going to show you a quick glimpse of what it looks like. So what happens now is that if you click on the quiz, you will be directed to this big screen and you can just click start now. And what happens is that you can just quickly start on answering your quizzes. So once you get to the results section, they will tell you what your personalities are uh, and which courses or ideal career paths that suit your interests. So it's actually that simple. And if you have any questions for edu advisor, don't worry, there's also a space for you to do that. You can just click on our info desk and we'll be directed to a our main booth. Yeah, sorry, yeah, the internet's kind of loading. And then you can just click here. Click here to talk to us and our counselors, our professional counselors will be with you right away. So let's just go on and wait for our next. All right, so our next speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Ramesh Kumarisan from Ames University who will speak about the career pathway for dental te technologists. So if you're interested in learning the works and production behind braces and even dentures, be sure to stay tuned as we'll begin shortly. So I'm just going to pull um, Dr. Ramesh real quick as he's already in the stream. Hello, Dr. Ramesh. Oh, hello, Ms. Nina. How are you? Oh, hi. Hi. I'm good. I'm good. How are you, doctor? Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, um, to those of you who just tuned in to our webinar session, welcome and good afternoon. Yeah. So you're currently watching, you're currently watching our webinar series as part of Edu Advice Virtual Education Fair, where we have academicians and um, professionals and industry professionals will be weighing in a number of topics, ranging from choosing your education pathway to jobs and careers. I'll be your host for today. My name is Nina, and we have Dr. Ramesh Kumar Resen here today um, from, <coughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar Resen from uh, Ames University. Um, so sorry, yeah, um, Dr. Ramesh, I think I have some sort of technical glitches with my internet connection. Hello, doctor. Hello, yeah. yeah Hi, Hi I can hear you. All right, perfect. Yeah. Um, I'm going through some sort of technical glitches with my internet. So okay. if you don't mind, if you could just Fine. bear with me for a minute. Sure, 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 sure. Thank you, thank you. Okay. real quick one. Let me just fix my technical glitches. Okay. Right, something is wrong with my screen here. Let me just Just a quick minute, yeah, doctor. Apologies. Yeah, okay, so okay. we're okay. thank you. So we're back. So sorry for our audience who are watching that some there's been some sort of technical glitches, but I am back right now. Okay, so let's just continue where we left off. My name is Nina. I'm your host for today. And we have Dr. Ramesh Kumarisan, Associate Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Dentistry at Ames University, who will be sharing with us about the ins and outs of a dental technologist as well as the in-demand career opportunities. So just a quick background about our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Ramesh Kumarisan has been an active team member in designing the curriculum of the Bachelor of Dental Technology program in Malaysia. After completing his Bachelor of Dental Surgery from Vinayaka Missions Dental College in India, Dr. Ramesh furthered his postgraduate degree in oral and maxillofacial surgery from the KLES Institute of Dental Sciences, Belgium. After a stint of training in stem cells and regenerative medicine from Alta Stem Laboratories, Dr. Ramesh is now the Associate Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Dentistry at Ames University. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramesh, for joining us today in our webinar session. Yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Hina. How are you doing? How are you doing now? Uh, yeah, great. I'm in India now. 
Yeah, we heard that you were in Malaysia. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I came for a short trip and I was locked down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> all right, so I guess we can uh, move on with our um, session. I'm just going to inform all the live audience that's watching if you have any questions for Dr. Ramesh about the dentistry or even about Ames University, please leave your comments below and your questions below and we'll get to it at the end of the session. Yeah, without, um, doctor, would you like to continue presenting your uh, yeah. slides now? Yeah, All sure. Right. So, I'll share my, yeah. Yes. All right, you can, you can start sharing your slides now, doctor. You can just, yeah. Yeah. Can just click the share screen option yeah. all right okay there it is so without further yeah. ado um let's hear it from dr ramesh yeah thank you so much uh, Sinina, for an uh, um, uh, introduction and uh, it's really great hi um, uh, ladies and gentlemen it's really great to talk to you uh, today and myself i'm uh, dr ramesh kumaresan i'm currently the dean of uh, faculty of dentistry ames university and uh, in this talk i wanted to share with you uh, an insight about a much rewarding career uh, but uh, actually uh, not well taken up career now uh, that's about dental technology which has a uh, very much demand currently in malaysia um, so before we start with the talk, uh, just to show you about the uh, workplace where I currently work. Uh, this is Ames University, the lush green campus and very beautiful campus, uh, one of the beautiful campus in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. I just invite you all to have a look at uh, the conducive environment that we have in such a good university. And um, I would like to start my talk uh, by thanking the frontliners currently uh, who are making a tremendous change in the confining the current pandemic and uh, uh, no doubt uh, Malaysia is doing uh, the best right from the superior authority to the common public what we have seen currently in the country is a very good teamwork uh, as we all know teamwork is the key for success that's what is exactly happening in the country now a very good teamwork that makes the dream work that is confining the pandemic situation and uh, it's not only in country now teamworks works everywhere uh, in any field you take you need a team and you need an effective teamwork to deliver the best and uh, in my field, that is dentistry, it's not an exception. Creating a beautiful dental smile, that is the objective of my profession. And that too cannot be done only by a dentist. We need a dental team that work behind to create a beautiful smile to any patient who reaches us. And I have just mentioning here, it is definitely a teamwork. It's not only the dentist who can bring up a beautiful smile so to talk about smile smile or free yes but it's worth a million because the joy of changing a person's life by creating a beautiful gracious smile is one of the rewards of being in a dental team so uh, i have been repeatedly mentioning here as a dental team because most of them would not be knowing what a dental team is because when you go to a clinic whom you meet is a dentist or an assistant as well along with the dentist this is what a patient thinks is a dental team but there is more than this to a dental team so just to introduce our dental team here these are the members of a dental team who work in the clinic as well as background in the laboratory to bring in a beautiful smile on a patient. We have a dental surgeon who will be treating you in a clinic. Apart from that, we also have a dental nurse and currently we call them as dental therapists who are a vital member of a dental team. 
followed by that we have dental surgery assistant uh, dental surgery assistant is one who will be assisting the dentist throughout the procedure apart from that we also have a dental assistant uh, who do not assist the dentist during the procedure but they do the other uh, arrangements in the clinic as well as in the office job in a dental clinic. And we have another person in the team that is the dental technologist. Most of the time, people would have not met a dental technologist in the dental clinic because the dental technologists are a vital part of dental team but are not found working in the clinic because their um, uh, territory is mostly in a dental laboratory. So how do they work? What are they actually? Um, as I told, they are a vital part of any dental team. Suppose a patient is going to a dentist and the patient needs a crown or a cap to be placed on the teeth. Um, the dentist takes an impression and that impression will be sent to a dental laboratory. And in the laboratory, the dental technologist or the one who will be fabricating a denture or the cap and then they pass it to the dentist and the dentist will fix it back into a patient's mouth and uh, as you see it is a 50 50 percentage of work that is shared between a dentist and a dental technologist neither can't survive without the other that's how it is so this is what a dental technologist do and to make it very simple dental technologist is a personnel who can be thought of as an artist with a thorough understanding of the dental material sciences. As you all know, in dental sciences, we use a lot of materials, both in clinic as well as in laboratory. We will be using a lot of materials and a dental technologist is expected to know in-depth knowledge about these materials, as well as he should be an artistic person because this artistic skill is what is required to fabricate any prosthesis, either intraoral inside the mouth or in the maxillofacial region. Just as you see in these pictures here on the right side, you have the dentures. On the left side, you have the crowns and bridges, which are mainly fabricated by a dental technologist in the lab. But Dental technology is not just confined to these crowns, bridges, and dentures. They do also do maxillofacial prosthesis. Suppose a patient who met with an accident has lost a part of his nose, or sometimes there might be a patient who has a cancer surgery done and a part of their eyes has been removed, nose has been removed. Um, in that case, the patient's aesthetic and function is highly affected. So in order to bring back the aesthetic, the function, as well as the psychiatric aspect of the patient to give them a psychological support, these dental technologists come in to fabricate the maxillofacial prosthesis. That is the prosthesis that can replace their eyes, ears, nose, and all other part of head and neck region. So this is again another specialization of a dental technologist. And it's not only ends here, they can also do a implant dentistry related prosthesis now implantology in dentistry is going very fast and dental technologists are an immense part of this implant dentistry and also braces or dental uh, orthodontics so when you have to place and braces and you have to give any appliances the orthodontist mainly depends on the dental technologist to fabricate these um, uh, appliances as such so to put it in a very simple way Dental technology is the technical side of the dentistry, whereas the sciences deal by, dealt by the dentist and the dental technologist deals with the technical aspect of dentistry. And dental technologist on prescription of a dentist, they make any prosthesis or appliances for head and neck region. And in fact, these prosthesis, what they make is going to bring back the aesthetics and the beautiful smile on a patient's face. So these dental technologists demands a high level of responsibility accuracy as well as an artistic skill to bring back that smile on a patient now in malaysia where all you could see these dental tech 
technologist working uh, these are some of the areas where the dental technologists have found working now uh, they have a job opportunity or career opportunity in these fields number one is the government dental clinic in fact every government dental clinic in malaysia will have an attached dental laboratory and dental technologist or the vital part of that laboratory and we also have a significant number of dental technologists working in armed forces dental laboratory uh, in malaysia as well as there are plenty of private sector dental laboratories in country uh, if i'm not wrong there are around more than 500 dental technology laboratories all over the country and we have thousands of dental technologists working in malaysia in the private sector apart from these public and private sectors dental technologists also have a very good scope in companies who manufacture dental materials for the research purpose for testing purpose they need the expertise of a dental technologist who are an expert in dental material sciences as well apart from this we also have a, a significant number of dental technologists who are serving in universities and teaching institutions uh, who guide and supervise the students during their processes so these are some of the career opportunities currently available in country for dental technologists but dental technology is not restricted to one country it is a global profession um, as a dental technologist you have a high demand in international market as well if you are a skilled dental technologist you can you can uh, practice in any country and in malaysia dental technologist is a registered profession under allied health profession division uh, it is like uh, allied health profession division has around 24 to 25 fields and dental technology is one among the allied health professions and um, in malaysia also the private dental industry that is a private dental laboratory gets a bulk of work from the dentist in fabricating the process so there is a huge demand and a requirement in the private dental industry for a dental technologist especially for a skilled dental technologist and there is definitely no barrier of becoming a self employed um the dental technologists are entrepreneur by themselves so um they can start their own dental laboratories with a little bit of investment and they can definitely excel as an entrepreneur in malaysia and uh, among dental technologists dental technology itself is a huge umbrella of field uh, in which we have a lot of specialization still. Um, as you see in the picture here on the left hand side, you can see the dentures. As I told before, you have removable or fixed dentures, and a dental technologist can focus mainly on this, or else a dental technologist can focus on a maxillofacial prosthesis. As you see in the picture in the middle, you can replace any lost maxillofacial regions. Uh, by, by the way, the maxillofacial means. The head, neck, and oral region. Any, any, anything lost in the head, neck, and oral region can be replaced by an artificial prosthesis with the help of a dental technologist. And uh, next, a dental technologist may only focus on an orthodontic appliances. When you go to an orthodontist, he's going to place you some um, brackets and bands. So, a um, dental technologist will support an orthodontist by preparing and the appliances which can be placed on the patient's oral cavity to move the teeth and align the teeth uh, it's not only there but also in implant dentistry a dental technologist can exclusively practice as an implant specialist uh, they fabricate the processes that is mainly required for an implant dentistry so these are some of the uh, career opportunity or specialization that a dental technologist can focus Apart from that, um, there might be some questions like, is a career as a dental technologist really rewarding? Um, I would like to pose seven questions to whoever who have that particular um, query. Uh, if you have to find your career more fulfilling, you have to ask yourself these seven questions before you take up any career. Uh, starting number one, you have to see whether the career fits well with who you are. So uh, you have a passion. You have to see whether the career which you choose 
caters your passion. And the second point is whether the occupation is compatible with your work related values. So every person have a life value, a work related value is the profession or the career which you choose is compatible with those work related values. And the third one is how enjoyable is your work. You may have a passion, but at the same time, if the job what you are doing is not interesting, not entertaining, no point in continuing it. So you have to know whether your career is going to make you more entertaining or you are going to enjoy your job duties. Along with that, the schedule of your work, uh, they, they say it as an work-life balancing. Does your work really help you in balancing your life and work? That's what is very important as well. And not to avoid money, um, make enough money. You have to make enough money. Whatever career you choose should give you the sufficient money. And that also has to help you to advance in your profession. So it should not stop there. Whatever career you take up should have an opportunity to advance your knowledge and also your level of education. And last but not least, whatever career you choose or program you carry out, there should not be any trouble in finding a job. Means the job prospect should be bright for those career which you are going to choose. And of all these seven questions, the first three questions are more of a personal question since you have to ask to yourself whether this particular career fits me, is it compatible or am I going to enjoy my job after I choose this career? But I may tell you how dental technology would suit you on based on these seven questions. Let, let's see some of the examples in um, dental technology, how it suits your job. Um, are you going to to enjoy your work? Is your work going to be entertaining? Uh, how I look at this is dental technology is more of an artistic job. Uh, yeah, there is also a science part of it, but more of skills. If you are creative, if you are innovative, if you are artistic, then dental technology is the right career for you. Because as you see on the picture here, it, it involves more of an artistic hand a proper eye-hand coordination, and you have to be creative. And also, you have to keep in mind that you are going to bring back the aesthetics and smile on the patient. So that makes yourself a creator. So you have to be more creative. So if this uh, challenge will be, you will be facing every day of your career. So that is really entertaining, and you will be enjoying that side of the job as a dental technologist. And coming to the next, work-life balance. So uh, in this busy world, everybody is back of work. You have a lot of work tension, you forget your life, but a life as a dental technologist has a very much balanced life. Um, it means you are not going to work 27, 24 by seven. It, it's just uh, from morning nine to five and you just bring up the uh, work what the dentist gives you. You just be creative, create the smile on the patient's face and just give it, yeah, give it back to the dentist and he's going to fix it to the patient. So just you have enough time to your work and you also can enjoy your life with your family. So that is a very much work and life balancing situation as a dental technologist. Next, are you going to earn a good salary? Well, you should know how much a dental technologist are capable of earning. Uh, right, this is an uh, uh, information I just extracted from salaryhood.com. An average dental technologist salary per month is around 4,000 US dollars. It's not only in US, even in United Kingdom, a dental technologist are paid uh, a pound of 1,900 pounds uh, per month. Uh, that's what a dental technologist could earn uh, with their skills and expertise. Uh, coming back to Malaysian scenario, um, an uh, information gathered from salaryexplorer.com. Um, a Malaysian dental technologist 
earns an average of 5,600 Malaysian ringgits. Uh, and the range varies from 2,700 ringgits to 8,900 ringgits based upon your expertise, the year of experience, and the skills you have. Definitely not a uh, minimum amount. And uh, this graph clearly tells as your experience increases as a dental technologist, your pay increases you any any dental technologist the starting will be salary will be around 3200 ringgits and you have an opportunity to reach up to 8500 malaysian ringgits in and based upon your experience a year of experience and also that depends upon the skills that you are going to develop throughout your career now uh, i hope uh, the participants might know what a dental technology is about, what a dental technologist role is in a dental team, and uh, why rewarding is or how rewarding is a career as a dental technologist. Um, let me also share some gateway into dental technology, like uh, at various level, you may be at various level of education now. How could you become a dental technologist? Uh, if you are an SPM or O level or UCE, you have three pathways to become a dental technologist. The first one is you can take up an STPM, foundation, A level, or matriculation. And from there, you can lead into dental technology as a bachelor degree. Or uh, you can have a diploma in dental technology or even a post diploma. And uh, you also do have an entry into Bachelor of Dental Technology program. And if you have a diploma in any health sciences, you too can have an entry into a field of dental technology. Now, if you watch here, uh, under dental technology, you have two different type of programs or levels of uh, training. Uh, you can become a diploma in dental technology or a bachelor in dental technology. Um, bachelors in dental technology is a very new field in Malaysia and having a lot of scope and demand in market now. Uh, because uh, other than I, I'll just uh, uh, tell you about the dental technology program shortly. But before that, uh, what is the number of years you have to spend to become a skilled dental technologist? If you take up the first pathway, like uh, after finishing STPM foundation or A-level, that is one year of program, followed by the dental technology program itself is a four-year program. So in total, you have to spend five years in gaining these skills. If you are taking up the second route, like into the diploma in dental technology, followed by a degree. Three years is a diploma in dental technology course. And if you have a diploma in dental technology, you can directly enter into second year, that is year two of dental technology program, into Bachelor of Dental Technology program. So in total, you have to spend around six years to become a skillful dental technologist with a bachelor's degree. And if you are choosing the third uh, streamline, like you have a diploma in dental and uh, health sciences, then three years of diploma or two and a half years of diploma together with a four years of dental technology course, it's around seven years that you become a skillful dental technologist. This is uh, just of what are the various gateway to become a dental technologist. So I will just take you through the various courses in dental technology that is available in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, we have a diploma in dental technology, that's a three years course, and we have a bachelor's in dental technology, that's a four years course. Um, a diploma is now being upgraded to into a bachelor's degree. Uh, there are a few institutions that provide diploma in dental technology, but um, uh, us, so we have to progress in the career with a good educational level. We always demand the best. So I would demand a, a bachelor degree in dental technology. And currently, uh, very, very few reputed institutions or universities are providing bachelor's degree in dental technology. Uh, like, like you have University of Otago in New Zealand, or we can have a Griffith University, Griffith University in Australia and even few institutions and universities in UK and also in US do provide dental technology program at bachelor's level. In Malaysia, uh, Amst University is the only university currently that 
um, delivers Bachelor of Dental Technology program. And in fact, um, this is the first and uh, fully recognized program in Malaysia. And not only in Malaysia, in all entire Southeast Asia, we have the Bachelor degree in Dental Technology only in Ames University. So I'll just tell you uh, why bachelor's is better than diploma and also why taking up a course in a uh, country is better than going to overseas. Uh, obviously, um, the, the degree from New Zealand, Australia, uh, it's very uh, not, not so cost effective, I would say, uh, but in Malaysia, it's very much cost effective at, and we have the standards similar to any other international countries. Coming to the difference between a diploma as well as a bachelor's degree, uh, diploma, as I told, is a three-year program uh, where you focus mainly on expertizing and removable partial dentures. That is a denture which uh, we usually pay place to in the patient for replacing few teeth. And uh, some might be a complete denture or a fixed processes that is uh, the crown and the bridge work. So they mainly focus and uh, the expertise in these uh, basic uh, dental technological procedure. But as a dental uh, technologist with a bachelor's degree, you have an, an comprehensive or holistic uh, uh, the graduates. Like you can focus on removable partial dentures, fixed dentures, maxillofacial processes, orthodontic appliances, computer-aided dental technology, implant processes. These are the various specialization that you can do or you get expertized and skilled as a bachelor's degree holder in dental technology. And uh, also, the, since it is a bachelor's degree, uh, the graduates are expected to have a critical thinking, problem-solving, uh, competency and uh, we do encourage research methodology following by that uh, leadership skills and entrepreneur quality is very much expected from a bachelor's degree holder in a dental technology program so a bachelor's degree holder makes you a holistic graduate that is a 21st century learner with all the competencies that is expected from a 21st century student or an job employees so also salary wise from a diploma to a degree in malaysia there is around a 24 percentage of increase in the salary which you will be paid as a bachelor's degree i hope it's really worth it to have a bachelor's degree in dental technology now coming to the program what uh, Ames University provide uh, we do have a bachelor degree in dental technology and this is the first ever bachelor's degree in dental technology in Malaysia or in fact in Southeast Asia and it's a four years program and we have eight semesters and this program is fully accredited by Malaysian Qualification Agency that's MQA and why choose AIMS? Uh, uh, a similar program is even uh, offered by various international universities, but uh, the product program currently followed in AIMS is benchmarked with all the international curriculum. And we have a world-class infrastructure for dental technology program exclusively for our dental technology program and an experienced academicians who have more than 20 to 30 years of experience in training dental technologists and all these things at a very affordable fee. Uh, then what else you need? Uh, that's the best thing that you can get to become a dental technologist in country. So it's not only there, we also have an additional exposure to our students because uh, learning is not only limited to the campus it has to be learned from other outside world as well so we have a collaboration with university of otago new Zealand, which has one of the best uh, in dental technologies currently and uh, so the students of ames university in dental technology program do also get a chance to go to university of otago for a short attachment to learn all the uh, recent advances in dental technology also uh, since dental technologists are currently working in various sectors like the public sectors private sectors and educational sectors 
we do have or encourage our students to do have attachment in all these sectors. So our students go to a public dental technology laboratory, a private dental technology laboratory, as well as an educational institution for a short attachment to know how things work in those sectors. That's very important. That's going to decide or going to give you a guidance on how you are going to uh, take up your career after you graduate as a dental technologist. So we are focusing on that and we give attachments to these various sectors also during the four years of course. And job prospects, as I told, the seven question out of all the seven questions, the seventh question is, do you get a job immediately after you graduate? Uh, here is the proof. Um, we had nine graduates, that's the batch one student of dental technology course in Ames University, uh, who joined in in 2015. And after four years in 2019, they graduated, that is last year. And all the nine graduates are now being employed and that we could see a 100% employability rate. And it doesn't only stop there. Um, we do give them an opportunity to have in-campus interview. Uh, we call in the best dental technology laboratories in country and also international laboratories to conduct interview on to our graduates. And uh, most of the graduates have also gained employment following the interview review and it's really cool that you get employed well before you give your final semester examination that's what we have done to all our batch one graduates and for our next batch which to them so these are some of the laboratories which have conducted their interview session with us oriental welfare group from Japan, and we have uh, orthotech dental laboratories in Penang and also skywind dental laboratory from Silla who have conducted interview to all our graduates and they have they are very much happy to see the amount of expertise that these graduates have gained in this program so just to give you a gist of various dental laboratories in malaysia and dental technologists in malaysia in Malaysia, uh, there are around 900 dental technology laboratories and uh, 350 of them are under uh, KKM, that's under uh, uh, public uh, dental laboratories in government setups, and uh, around 538 registered private dental laboratories. That brings up a total number of around 900 uh, dental technology laboratories in Malaysia. And coming to dental technologists currently in Malaysia, uh, around 1,000 of them work in public sector. And uh, in private sector, we have around 800 of them registered with Malaysian Dental Technology Association. And uh, nearly 90 of them are working in educational institutions. And there are still around 5,000, approximately 5,000 non-members uh, who are not at registered might be in Malaysian Dental Technology Association. Uh, talking about Malaysian Dental Technology Association is a private dental technologist association established recently and uh, under the uh, allied health profession. And uh, they are encouraging all the dental technologists to get registered under that association. And it is in progress going on. So these non-members are shortly going to become a member, a registered dental technologist. And if you see in total, we have around six to 7,000 dental technologists in Malaysia, which is much, much less than what is required in Malaysia to cater all the dentists and also the patients. So, um, and, um, I would say 99% of all these dental technologists have a diploma uh, in dental technology with few having a post basic degree uh, as well. Um, and uh, hardly there are 10 to 15 uh, degree holders in dental technology in Malaysia. So there is a huge scope for a dental technologist with a degree, a bachelor's degree, especially you have skills, a comprehensive skill of what all a dental technologist are able to do. So that tells you what the job prospectus as well as what dental technology holds for you in future. Uh, it is definitely a rewarding 
career. And um, if you want to know in further about the entry requirements and various other um, uh, program structure of a dental technologist, feel free to just log into Ames University website, ames.edu.my, where you get a comprehensive detail about everything dental technology has for you. And I would like to just end with this small quote, uh, three C's in life, choices, chances, and changes. You must have a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. So you have to bring up a change in your life. You have to take chance and take make a choice now. And I hope if you are having these seven characters and you are um, very good are going to be a very good dental technologist. So for everyone who asks a dental technology, does it suit me? If you have an artistic instinct, if you have an attention to details, and if you have a very good eye-hand coordination, if you are curious to learn new things and you have a good color perception, means dental technologists work on colors in getting a patient's beautiful smile so you should have a color perception you should work independently as well as you should have an entrepreneurial ambition if you have a mixture of this then you are a good dental technologist or you're going to become a good dental technologist that is a rewarding career so dental technologist is truly a rewarding career but it requires hard work commitment and compassionate nature that it makes it a successful calling for you. So I hope I have given uh, insight about what dental technology and dental technologist is all about. Uh, uh, if you have any question, you can just type in in the comment section. I'm ready to share my knowledge further on this. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramesh. That was a very enlightening presentation on dental technologies. I think a lot of us did not know that to be a dental technologist, you need to have a flair for the arts. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really true. Yeah. Um. Let's just uh. Let's see what questions do we have for you. I think we can see quite an array of questions, Doctor. You can actually just uh scroll down some more. Yeah. 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 So if you can see, our first question mm. is actually from Damien Ui. This is a very long one. Can you see it, Doctor? Um, yeah, I could see. All right, so I'll be I'll be putting the questions right into the stream. Yeah. Yeah, right. please. Okay. Um. Uh, so Damien, uh, uh, the question is: What did you enjoy about it? What did you dislike about it? What makes you study this course? What would you do differently if you want to start over? And what are your advices before getting into this field? Okay. Um, what did you enjoy about it? Um, uh, I, I'm, I am currently a dentist, actually. I would love to be a dental technologist uh, because I have uh, artistic uh, uh, abilities to become a dental technologist, definitely. But as a dental technologist, what I enjoy, uh, because I see uh, or I guide the dental technologist students here, uh, it's about how entertaining is the program. Uh, nothing could give you a better uh, satisfaction when you see a smile on a patient's face. Uh, in Ames University, ma mainly a dental technologist will not deal with the patient at all. It's only the communication with the dentist and the dentist deals with the patient. But in Ames University, we make it a point that when a dentist or a dental student uh, treats a patient and the work is given to a dental technologist, the dental technology students as well are present in the clinic with the patients. So they directly communicate with the patients. So all our patients are aware who are all a team in the dental uh, team actually working, the members in the dental team. So that I really enjoy about in dental technology, the artistic part of it and seeing a patient smile in front of you. And what did you dislike about it? No, mm -hmm. there is nothing I could dislike about dental technology. Uh, the mere uh, the view of the maxillofacial prosthesis that I'm a maxillofacial surgeon, a prosthesis made by a dental technologist. The procedure of making it is very tedious, but the end result is really happy. Uh, so I don't have anything that has, I dislike about it. What makes you study this course? Um, 
uh, as a dental technologist, if I have to answer as a, uh, uh, I'm a dentist, but as a dental technologist, what I communicate with my colleagues, uh, they say the same thing. Uh, it is an artistic work. Uh, you don't need to break your head or you don't need to um, be very stressful when you do some work. You have to enjoy the work. I, I could see our dental technologists playing music and just working in the laboratory. So that really what a dentist cannot do in a clinic. Uh, that, yeah. That's the unhappiness part of it. And what would you do differently if you want to start over? Um, uh, I will not start over again, but if I can start now, I can. I would be able to again become a dental technologist as an additional training for me. I would like to do like to do that. Mm -hmm. And what are your advices before getting into this field? I have given yeah. the advice already. The seven questions you answer for all the seven questions, and that that's what makes you to excel in this course. Mm -hmm. So you need to have an artistic mind, and you should be really creative. If that is what is you, then this field will really suit you. All right. So there's one question from Ash. I'm just going to pull the question uh, yeah. right into the stream. OK, what is the difference between dental technology and dentistry? Can I go from one to another? Uh, well, um, Dentistry and dental technology are different. As I told, dentistry deals with the clinical aspect of it. Dental technology is the technical aspect or the laboratory aspect of it. Um, I, I look at it like this. If, if as I give an example in my talk as well, when a patient goes to a dentist, the dentist looks at the patient, he drafts what are the treatment needed for the patient, and also if a patient needs a prosthesis to be placed in the, in the oral cavity, he, he passes that to a dental technologist. The information will be passed to a dental technologist. In the laboratory, the dental technologist uh, designs a prosthesis and he hands it over back to the dentist. And the dentist can fix it into the patient's home mouth. So this is two different fields in a dentistry, one dealing with the patient, another dealing with the laboratory work. And uh, one cannot exist without the other. A dentist cannot go to a laboratory and sit and do a denture work. Though we have the basic knowledge of how to do a denture, we have done it back in our graduation time. But now we don't go to a laboratory. We have specific experts doing that. So dental technologists or experts, they do prosthesis and dental mm -hmm. surgeons are the one who deal with the patient. And can I go from one to other? Uh, definitely. Uh, but uh, you have to go through the entire. For dental surgery, we have five years of program. And dental technology is four years of program. Though there is a lot of over, um, I mean, the uh, program, is there, there is a crossover between these two. Uh, the initial years might be almost the same subject. But it is very difficult to do a credit transfer from as a dental technologist. I have to again go through the entire dental surgery program because, right. as I told, it's dealing differently. Right. So, in order for you to jump together, you gotta go back to basics. Then is that it? Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. Noted. There is one question here from Nala. She's asking about salary. How much does a dental technologist earn? Okay. Um, I have again placed it in my uh, slides presentations as well. Um, uh, in taking uh, an example from our um, graduates mm -hmm. who have graduated last year, the starting pay for the graduates of fresh dental technologists is 3,000 plus Malaysian ringgits. Mm -hmm. So, and based on their experience from there, they can go up to eight to 9,000 ringgits. And instead of you getting paid, a dental technologist or themselves an entrepreneur, they can start their private laboratory and they can earn much, much more than what they are being paid. So the, right. those are the opportunities for them. All right, okay. So I, I hope Nala took that in. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one here from Chris Z. I think this is a very long question. Yeah, Chris Z. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there is a huge demand for dental technologists. May I know what's the starting salary like for fresh graduates, I think we already have the answer. And if yeah. I wait to start my own dental laboratory in future, what are the things that I need to be aware of? Um, you have to be aware of means dental technology should have a good contact with dentist. Uh, mm -hmm. That is a part of their training as well, communication skills and teamwork. So that itself will uh, get you an establishment. So you have to see where you have a lot of uh, dental clinics and you have to cater the dental clinics. That would get you an ideal positioning. 
and apart from that uh, based on your expertise so which particular field you are interested in a uh, few dental technologists may be interested in only getting a denture work so you can establish a laboratory that caters only denture work or if you want to be a porcelain related work you can just establish that or if you need uh, the best an um, state of art dental laboratory with all the recent or late uh, latest technologies you can also establish that so you have to decide where you are going to set up and to what um, um what do you call uh, uh, what is your specialization you are going to start with so based on that you can fix the laboratory so even when starting your own dental technology lab there is a specificity city that you can and pursue in order to build one yeah uh, yeah you you can decide on what you are going to cater on uh, means uh, you can also have everything like a, a denture or a fixed one or a porcelain or implant we do have uh, labs in malaysia which caters every sector of dental technology or we do have laboratories which is focusing on only one particular uh, part of dental technology right. so it depends upon yeah, as you complete your course you get a guidance from there as you experience you know more and you know where is your passion towards or which particular specialization is your passion towards and you can go, just go and establish that that particular dental laboratory all right okay noted um yeah. one last question here doctor by any yeah. um here she says yeah. here is it true that everyone's teeth are different i saw on tv they say our dental structures are like fingerprint um yes uh, you are correct any it is exactly like your fingerprint or your eye sign what what they use for scanning uh, mm -hmm. everybody's teeth is different and the arrangement of the teeth is different so even if you just look at your palate or uh, the upper jaw palate uh, you have some lines you can just pass your tongue over it and you can just feel those irregularities mm -hmm. those irregularities are also used as a forensic evidence to find out or identify a person so not an uh, palatal rugae we call it is not same for every person that is also like your finger uh, uh, so what is that uh, grip it's totally sure. different whatever you have in fingerprint similarly you have it in the palatal rugae so the tooth is also uh, individual to each person Wow. Okay, that's actually very that's like new information. I think a lot of people yes. uh, put so much emphasis on just thumbprints, yeah. But even for teeth, that's how they could differentiate. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Doctor Ramesh, we have come to an end of our session. Thank you so much for answering all yeah. of the questions. Um, we hope that our audience has gained some valuable information from this session. Um, we hope that we could get to see you again, Doctor Ramesh, for our next webinar session. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much for hosting, Miss Nina. And very nice to hear from the participants as well. If you have any uh, guidance or if you have any queries, you can always contact us in Ames University or also to Edu ed ed Advisor. We'll yes. be happy to uh, get you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Nina. Bye bye. All right. So there you have it, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumarasen from Ames University. If any questions regarding uh, dentistry or dentist uh, technologists, um, go ahead and check out Ames University's booth at our Edu Advisor Virtual Education. So it ends tomorrow, so do not miss your chance to do so. And uh, that's all we have for today. It's been a pleasure, and thank you to our audience for tuning in to Edu Advisor's webinar series. We hope you gain some insightful and inspiring information. To pursue your dream courses, and don't forget to check out Edu Advisors Virtual Education Fair and get all the information you need. Just click chat at the respective universities or go on to the info desk and speak to our counselors personally. Hope to see you again. Thank you for watching and goodbye.